the University of Johannesburg, the future reimagined. Welcome to the number one university in uh, Johannesburg, Gauteng, and South Africa. Certainly, at least as publication outputs are concerned. Well done, Vice Chancellor. Oh, no, I mean, maybe you should thank the researchers. Well, well done, <laughs> colleagues. I'm a researcher. Yeah. Um, no, I, I, really think it's a, I, I really think it's a sterling performance by the, by the university to see the uh, trajectory just going upwards. And I see Prof. Butambara, you've produced at least seven units for the year already. That's, that's, <laughs> that's fantastic to see. Because, you know, to, to keep up with that trajectory, our dean will tell, tell you, in, in, our, in our faculty, the Faculty of Humanities, Prof. Mutambara, I, would, I just wish to inform you, we are greeted by the words, where are my units? Where are my publications? <laughs> so good afternoon, colleagues, um, and welcome to this, uh, this book launch um, by um, one of our most um, respected um, young professors. Um, it's, it's the third in a three volume series. And I think that may be a, a, a typing error um, because I don't think this volume is going to stop at three, inshallah, God willing. I've, I've had the privilege to meet Professor Arta Mutambara in 1991 when we were fellow Rhodes Scholars, um, and uh, we were very unapologetic of taking some of the loot money uh, from Cecil Rhodes. So I was the South African um, at large Rhodes uh, Scholar. Prof. Mutambara was the Zimbabwe uh, at large Rhodes Scholar. So I've known this man for uh, the better part of what? Let me think now. Twenty. Uh, 30, oh, sorry, uh, 32, so, uh, Dean, I mean, I just wanted to make us look a bit younger. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I can, say, I can say a lot about Professor Mutambara, um, Vice Chancellor. Long before we formally entered the age of the decolonization of knowledge, long Professor uh, Devet, before there was the formal idea and notion of interdisciplinary studies and breaking down the, uh, excuse the pun, the Chinese walls between disciplines. Um, Prof. Mutambara actually uh, practiced it. I know of very, very few people who planned their career so meticulously as Prof. Mutambara did. Let me just give you some insights. So we met, um, as fellow Rhodes Scholars in September 1991. Prof. Mutambara actually read, uh, as they say in Oxford, we didn't say study. I mean, I, I can tell you the first time I got to my first social function uh, at Oxford, they said to me, what, what do you read? What are you here to read? I said, but clearly I'm having a ball. I'm not reading. Uh, <laughs> not knowing what they mean is what do you study? So, so he read for um, robotics and engineering. Um, soon after that, Prof. Mutambara actually succeeded Professor um, Adekeya Adebaju as the president of the Oxford Africa Society. In uh, VC, I became the social secretary. <laughs> I was responsible for the parties. <laughs> so I attracted the crowds. He indoctrinated the crowds. Um, and I just want to tell you a fascinating story. We had a group of African scholars and scholars from the Caribbean and, and scholars from Western society. It was quite an eclectic cosmopolitan group, uh, Professor Camilla. And here you had Professor Mutambara studying robotics, but he actually started a reading group. And those days we didn't have CDs and certainly not memory sticks and uh, blowtunt, Bluetooth. We didn't have that. <laughs> so we remember the VHS cassettes and so on. And we used to meet in Professor Mutambara's um, 
flat near New College, behind the King's Arms Bar. And this man would just educate us on Lenin and Marx and Marxism and Darwinism um, and Red Philosophy. But it was a serious political studies group, yet Professor Mutambara studied robotics and engineering. I want to tell you a more important story, and you know how seriously Prof, um, your predecessor, Prof Marwala, takes the Oxford Society, um, you know, the, the big Oxford debating society. So after every debate, there would be a winner announced of the debate. This man was not even part of debates, but he would win the prize for the most influential debate from the floor. <laughs> he, he would interject from the floor and literally win the prize for the most influential debater during the Oxford um, Africa Society. After completing his studies at Oxford, soon after that, Professor Mutambara actually became a um, professor at MIT in the United States. Also a professor, a visiting professor at NASA in the United States. Um, soon after that, joined McKinsey Incorporated um, in the United States. Continued with his studies. So just look at that trajectory and pace. A man who did not only um, read politics, but certainly practiced it. Uh, soon after returning um, back to Zimbabwe. Uh, what year was that, Prof? 2002. Soon after that, um, Professor Mutambara actually became the deputy prime minister uh, of his country. And I can now openly say to all of you, he had, or shall I say, still harbors presidential uh, ambitions. I don't think that that story <laughs> is finished yet. But on a serious note, uh, VC, I'm introducing here a colossal figure, um, a, a doyen in his, in his own right, um, a man who takes um, ideas, ideational power, um, philosophical and political thought so seriously then we could, that we could regard him as a thought leader in his own right. So uh, what a privilege to uh, my friend, colleague, um, I dare to say even mentor. We spent many, many years together um, since the dreaming spires in that overrated island nation uh, there in the Atlantic. Um, but you've been an inspiration uh, to all of us. I see advocate um, Khopotse uh, Muti is with us. He was a successor of ours, but have always made time to come together. You know this Ox Oxbridge Mafia really take themselves very seriously, eh? sometimes too seriously. But um, what a journey you've walked, Professor. Uh, I think you're an asset, to the, uh, an asset to the University of Johannesburg. We're great to have you, uh, and we're looking forward to more sterling contributions. And congratulations uh, on the launch of this uh, third uh, volume. Um, it's almost an, um, a, a, an autobiographical um, political story that you're telling uh, through the lens of thought leadership. And the, the volume we're launching tonight um, is titled In Search of the Zimbabwean Dream, the Global South Ambition, Volume 3, by Arthur Guseni Oliver Mutambara. I'm looking forward to tonight's, um, just finally, I'm looking forward to tonight's um, inputs, particularly by Professor Mutambara, and the responses and reflections for one reason. Um, I had a meeting with my principal um, today, Prof. Kamala Naidu. It was, Dean, I actually wish to remind you it was a three-hour meeting in the end. Uh, it started at 11 and we finished at 2. But didn't I actually ended up talking about um, international politics, the predicament we seem to be finding ourselves in. And uh, having just um, gone through some of the chapters of this um, magnum opus in front of us, um, I wish to make a, a prediction for you. 
And I don't mean to be a pessimist. And we discussed it two weeks ago, you and I. And I actually said to Professor Mutambara, with what's going on, um, Vice Chancellor, and the predicament we find ourselves in, in international relations, and of course the domestic confluence and factors, that I would not put it past us that we might be on the cusp of the Zimbabweanization of South Africa. The tough road that that country has gone through for the past two decades or more, with sanctions still being uh, on the books of the United States Congress. Um, something tells me that for us as well, this might just be the calm before the proverbial storm. Sorry, I'm not here to depress you. Vice Chancellor, Principal, welcome. Thank you for uh, your presence. Thank you for making time. And I now invite you to come and share some opening, and, uh, reflection, opening reflections. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Landsberg. I must make sure that I don't make a mistake and, and, and put an R where it doesn't belong. <laughs> Professor Mutambar, colleagues, I'm looking at uh, Dean uh, Naidu, Vice Dean, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's really great to be here. I'll tell you, I'm glad I'm here, Prof Mutambara, because I had this feeling that if it didn't work out for me to be here, I would have been in your bad books forever. <laughs> you know, even after I said I'll be there last night, <laughs> Prof Mutambara was still sending me WhatsApp messages. <laughs> Polite that I could sense that what he wanted to hear from me is that I will be here. When it started, it was that I would be here for a few minutes and then say a word or two and leave because there was another commitment. That commitment was mysteriously cancelled. Now, I don't know. I'm not saying Prof. Mutambara did anything. <laughs> but whatever you did, Prof. Mutambara worked, and I'm glad to be here. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to welcome you all to the University of Johannesburg. Number one university, Prof. Chris, you know, based on the recent, uh, um, you know, uh, report from the Department of Higher Education and Training in terms of our subsidized research output. And I mean, that is a fact, you know. It's not like others where you have this subjective uh, criteria that people use to say how good they are, you know. But we are humble, we are hungry, we are going to remain hungry and we're going to press on, isn't it? Um, of course, we have gathered here to launch uh, Prof. Mutambara's book, Ideas and Solutions in Search of the elusive Zimbabwean dream, an autobiography of thought leadership, volume three. Now, earlier on, I was saying to Professor Mutambara that, uh, you know, in my culture, they say you don't grab a snake, you know, by the, by the tail, you know. You grab it by the head, you know. I feel like I'm grabbing the tail here, uh, the snake by the tail, because I have an autograph to volume three that I didn't get volume one and volume two. <laughs> that I'm not complaining because, um, you know, uh, Prof. Mutambara would, have, would, would expect me to have read volume one and two. So, but hopefully volume one in, volum, volumes one and two will come. Ladies and gentlemen, in 2008, the Zimbabwean lawyer and writer, Petina Gepa, I hope I pronounced the name correctly, wrote, for the Guardian, and I quote, the struggle for Zimbabwe lit up the imagination of people around the world. In London, New York, Accra, and Lagos, bell-bottomed men, I hope, <laughs> Prof. Lanstek, Prof. Mutambara, you're not part of this bell-bottomed men. I cannot imagine you in bell-bottoms. 
Anyway, bell-bottomed men and women with big hair and towering platform shoes sang the dream of Zimbabwe in the words of the eponymous song by Bob Marley. Every man has the right to decide his own destiny, close quote. Fifteen years on from these words, and they still ring true, ladies and gentlemen. We are on the precipice of a new set of elections that will occur against a difficult and rather grim context. Zimbabwe has been plagued by instability for over two decades, and hyperinflation has impoverished the once thriving country. The Henkers Annual Misery Index, HAMI, released just this morning, found that Zimbabwe takes the prize as the most miserable country in the world due to its economic performance. Last year, for instance, annual inflation was at 243.8%, and lending rates were at 131.8%. As Ibo Mandaza and Tony Rila asserted in February for Africa Report, open code Zimbabwe, like Rhodesia before it, has reached a Lancaster House moment, a point at which there is no possible solution without coherent regional and international action close coast. Against this rather, uh, uh, this backdrop, Prof. Mutambara's contributions track just how Zimbabwe has landed in this quagmire. For those of you unfamiliar with this background, with his background, in the early 2000s, Prof. Mutambara emerged as a prominent figure in Zimbabwean politics. He became the president of the Zimbabwe National Students' Union. During his time at the University of Zimbabwe and was instrumental in organizing student protests against the government. His involvement in activism continued throughout his career, advocating for democratic reforms, human rights, and social justice. In 2006, Professor Mutambara joined the Movement for Democratic Change, MDC. He quickly rose through the ranks and became the president of a faction within the party. During this time, he played a key role in uniting various factions of the MDC to form a coalition against the ruling ZANU-PF party. In February 2009, Professor Mutambara was appointed as the Deputy Prime Minister of Zimbabwe under the Global Political Agreement, which established a power-sharing government between the MDC and ZANU-PF. He shared this position with Tokozani Kupe, representing a different MDC faction. As Deputy Prime Minister, Professor Mutambara focused on economic and industrial development, advocating for foreign investment and technological advancements. After his term as Deputy Prime Minister, Professor Mutambara continued to be involved in politics, albeit in a lesser capacity. Prof. Mutambara is known for his intellectual prowess and his ability to blend his academic expertise with political activism. This new book is a continuation of a series that traces Prof. Mutambara's leadership thoughts and philosophical insights over 40 years from 1983 to 2023, as his generation sought to become the transformation it wished to see in Zimbabwe. Prof. Mutambara covers the transition to the Mnagangwa uh, <laughs> regime that has been met by illegitimacy and corruption to COVID-19 pandemic and its aftermath. This late, uh, latest volume details Prof. Dambara's contribution to the Zimbabwean government of national unity and his thoughts of the years that followed. He, his aim is to present a new shared national vision that is connected to a strong and effective plan. His argument is in line with the pursuit of an integrated and united Africa. Alongside politics, Prof. Mutambara examines the challenges of climate change, the global energy crisis, nuclear weapons, autonomous warfare, geopolitics, and deglobalization within the context of the fourth industrial revolution. It is a fantastic contribution 
to leadership thought and Zimbabwe's fraught history. As Prof Mutambara and his respondents will demonstrate this evening, there are certainly strong ideas and solutions, and we must actively fight to make this a reality. As Gepa wrote in 2008, ahead of the elections, words that still remain painfully relevant, ladies and gentlemen, open quote, Saturday's elections, election will give the country another chance to reimagine the dream. And if it fails this time, well, there will be the next election and the election after that. It is no immediate comfort perhaps to the suffering, but nothing lasts forever. Ian Smith thought his Rhodesia would last 1,000 years. It lasted less than 15. This too shall pass. And when it does, women and men and children will again leap to embrace a dream called Zimbabwe Close Code. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your attention. Congratulations, Professor Mutambar. Uh, thank you, Vice Chancellor, and a uh, very important um, message communicated uh, by your uh, opening remarks. Um, I just want to let you know, uh, reassure you, Vice Chancellor, even though you have not uh, received volumes one and two yet, they have been published. They have been written. <laughs> he didn't start with volume three and working his way back. <laughs> they do exist. Can you please make sure that the VC gets uh, copies, uh, Professor? because the VC might think you're doing it the Egyptian way, working backwards. So um, before I call on our uh, distinguished guest, our, our author, uh, Professor uh, Mutambara, um, our director of the Institute uh, for the Future of, of Knowledge, um, following Pro Professor Mutambara, um, we'll have uh, a lineup of um, speakers that will make some, some inputs. Uh, Professor Mutambara said I must... Uh, the only reason why I ask me to do it has nothing to do with uh, our association is because I'm the closest to a bouncer that he uh, could identify. So I must uh, keep all of you to uh, five minutes. And if you go over, Dean, I shall subtract from uh, Dr. Nguane, and that's how I will do it. So it will be the Dean, uh, Professor Naidu, followed by Dr. Nguane, um, Dr. Nkosana Moya, welcome. Uh, former colleague of uh, President uh, Mutambara uh, in Cabinet, uh, Professor Susie Gray, our Vice Dean in Humanities, uh, Professor David uh, Monyai, the man that understands the Communist Party of China more than any one of us here, Dr. Jetro Mpofu. Where's Dr. Mpofu? Dr. Mpofu here? I was just going to welcome him from uh, Bramfontein and say he's most welcome, uh, Prof. Mpofu. <coughs> Um, he might be joining us online. And last but by no means least, uh, Professor Tapiwe uh, Chakonda. Prof, good to see you again, as I've said. And of course, closing us out tonight will be um, my former boss, Professor Thea DeVet, who still behaves like my boss. Thank you very much. <laughs> Professor Mutambara, welcome. A round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Professor Arthur Mutambara. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, introduction. <clears throat> in search of the Zimbabwean dream, really we are actually in search of the African dream. Because most of the problems, some of the problems we have in Zimbabwe are there in Malawi, in Somalia, in Sudan, and of course in South Africa. So we are in search of the African dream. Not only that, some of these problems are all over in the global south. So we are in pursuit of the global south ambition. And we are in volume three of doing that. We are emphasizing that we are sick and tired of being sick and tired of describing problems. We are sick and tired of being sick and tired of criticizing without solutions. We are emphasizing ideas and solutions. What are you going to do about it? What is your alternative vision? What is your alternative idea? In addition to understanding the problem, but fundamentally, we must concentrate on ideas and solutions. That is what we're trying to do in this book, the ideas and the solutions. There's a background to it. It's volume number three, Vice Chancellor. There's number one, two, 
uh, and this one is the third one. We, we are being presumptuous. Thought leadership, what do we mean? Intellectual influence through innovative and pioneering thinking. That's what we're trying to do. Can we make a difference using ideas? Can we have influence through innovative and pioneering thinking? That's what we mean by thought leadership. But of course, there's a paradox. Those with power have neither ideas nor solutions. And those with ideas and solutions have no power. I don't know where you lie in this uh, uh, arena, Landsberg. Do you have power? <laughs> oh, you have no power. Oh, some have neither. <laughs> they have no power. They have no solutions. They have no ideas. They're just bankrupt. Anyway, what we're saying is, why don't we use our minds, our ideas and solutions to make a difference in South Africa, in Zimbabwe, and in the continent? Intellectual influence using innovative thinking and also pioneering thinking. We are also emphasizing documentation writing. In this case, I'm documenting the evolution of my thoughts, my ideas for 40 years, starting from Form 3 to now. Form 3 is like your grade 10. 10, yeah? And uh, so from grade 10 to now, um, and some of the things I cringe when I look at them because I said them. For example, in book one, I defended the one-party state. We we're very radical and defended uh, Marxist Mugabe. The one past, the, in fact, we did an essay in 1980 called The One-Party Parliamentary System Rather Than the Multi-Party System is more conducive and relevant to Zimbabwe's trust towards the socialist development. Do you agree? Give a reason to reply. And all of us young people then agreed because we were socialists, we were Marxists, and Mugabe was our hero. So I put the essay in uh, book one. I don't run away from things I've said. But you can see the growth because uh, a short three, four years uh, we're now opposing the one-party state. But we're trying to show the growth. We're trying to show the evolution of ideas. And of course, to spice it up, we have autobiographical material, we have pictures to make sure we entertain the reader. They don't become overburdened by thoughts and ideas. So the first volume is called The Formative Years and the Big Wide World from 83 to 02. That's 02, that's when I came back from America to South Africa and Zimbabwe. That's the book there, VC will get a copy. Then the second one is Path to Power. It sounds uh, ambitious, but we're saying Path to Influence. How can we get to make a difference? How can we make to, uh, uh, a way to influence? That's the book there. But today we're concentrating on ideas and solutions, which is our volume three. What are we saying? Reading and writing is important. Unfortunately, because of this technology of cell phones, we're not doing enough reading. Not to kids, but reading volumes of books. We're not doing enough of writing. We're not doing enough of documentation. So one key message that runs through the three volumes is the idea that documentation is divine. We must read and we must write. And also the message of succeeding against all odds, emphasizing a combination of academic excellence and social responsibility. Don't have one without the other. Some people are very loud as student leaders, but they are getting Fs. You don't impress me if you are a very strong student leader and you are getting a supplementary exam or being thrown out of class. Let us see a combination of academic excellence and consciousness. Some people are just conscious and revolutionary, but they're academically bankrupt. No. Let us have a combination of academic excellence and social responsibility and also understand that knowledge is global. We must produce and articulate alternative forms of knowledge and ideologies. We must prepare the struggle of the rude, the oppressed, and the downtrodden. What narrative is there about the continent? Who is writing the story of Africa? We must be producers of our own history. We can't leave it to Europe, to America, or to the Chinese and Indians. Africans on the continent must be the masters of the African story. We must write and we must document. African change makers are not writing. African political players are not writing. Academics do write, but we also want those who are not in the academy. Those in business 
must write. Those who are political leaders must write. George Bush has a book. Obama has four, five. Mandela did a good job, he wrote. President Becky, please, I'm waiting for that book, President Becky. <laughs> I know you write very well, but I want to see an autobiography. Comrade Zuma, we are waiting. <laughs> Ramaphosa, when you are done, we want to read about you. We must have a way of encouraging our people who are in business, business leaders, and those in the academy to write about their stories. Because every successful civilization has had a very strong reading culture. Every successful civilization has had a strong writing culture. Documentation is divine. We do have contributions to the world. We have philosophies, we have ideas. When I say Ubuntu, I am because we are. We are because I am. I am because you are. You are because I am. Munu munge vanu. There's nothing like this in Japan. Nothing like this in New York or Europe. This is our contribution to philosophy. What are we doing documenting its application in the academy? What are we doing to show its contribution to business? What are we doing to show its contribution to political philosophy and political uh, leadership? Let us write, let us contribute to philosophy, to psychology, to medicine, and to engineering. We believe in collective humanity. We believe in collective success. We believe in shared dignity. These are not values in America. These are values on the continent of Africa. Why don't we leverage them and make a difference on the continent? We are emphasizing, as I said before, we want solutions, we want ideas. The context, Zimbabwe. What is going on in Zimbabwe? We have a number of challenges. Low productivity, low production, low capacity utilization, very low business growth, and negative branding of the country. We have unprecedented deindustrialization. We have a trade deficit, lack of competitiveness. We have a debt-ridden economy. We have a currency crisis. Just last week, the US dollar was trading around one to 2,000. Just this week, 3,000, 3,500. Prices are changing while you are in the shop. You go and see an item, it's costing 50,000 RTGs. By the time you get to the till, no longer 50,000, it's 80. As we speak, that's what's happening in Zimbabwe, a currency crisis, high sovereign risk undermining FDI, reckless spending by a bloated government, a shrinking tax base, unemployment, and weak job creation. Recently, Zimbabwe has been in the media for the wrong reasons. Unprecedented corruption and looting of national assets and resources. Glaring incompetence and lack of statecraft literacy. You know, the second one is very different from the second, first one. The first one is very malign. When you are corrupt, you mean to do harm. When you are looting, you mean to do harm. But when you are incompetent, you actually might mean well. You just don't know how to do your job. When you lack statecraft literacy, you might mean well, but you're going to cause havoc because you are incompetent. People co 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 collide the two. Uh -uh, they're different. You might actually be a prophet or a pastor who prays every night, but you are incompetent, you're going to ruin the country. So we must address incompetence as different from looting, incompetence as different from corruption. Authoritarianism and the closing of democratic space, clansmanship, ethno-nationalism and ethnicity. You know, these are the polite way of saying tribalism. You know, in the academy, they say, no, it's not cool to say tribalism. You are saying the African is primitive. Say ethnic, <laughs> ethnicity, but basically a lot of tribalism in Zimbabwe. You have read about the gold mafia saga, four series on Al Jazeera, how gold was being taken out of the country and so on. You have read our friend here, Zunaid Moti, who paid the coup plotters in Zimbabwe. He paid a judge to declare that the coup was legal. 
He paid our president, he paid our vice president. All these things have been talked about. Bona has 21 farms. You know, former President Mugabe's daughter went through a divorce and the husband listed 21 farms. 21 farms belonging to the daughter of Robert Mugabe. Now, what does it mean? Again, our media folks are not thinking. If Bona has 21, what about the two sons? So we can say Mugabe had 40, 50 farms. Another question, if Mugabe had 40 farms in a system, how about his vice presidents? How about his army generals? How about his judges? We are not that naive. How can we have Mugabe here having 40 farms and his deputies got one, his ministers got one? It's irrational. If Mugabe has got 40 farms, his deputies have 10 to be generous, could be 20. Those ministers, those judges. So the meaning of that, my book tries to give you a context to say, how does this happen? I give you the rationale why it happens. I also give him Gabe's view of the land reform program, which you don't know. We'll come to that uh, issue of farms a bit later on. Uh, there was a looting and enabling SI. They came up with a law to say, you are not supposed to talk about purchases of medical instruments and this and the other so that people can't question purchases. There was an outcry in Zimbabwe and it was taken back. A looting enabling statutory instrument just a couple of weeks ago. Just last week, there was procurement of 32 helicopters, overpriced and illegally procured. I don't discuss these current things in my book, but in my book, you get to understand the system. You get to understand the motivation. You get to understand the modus operandi of the people running Zimbabwe through my book. So read my book if you, under, you have to understand the gold mafia. <laughs> if you have to understand Zunai Dimoti and the coup plotters, read my book. Again, we emphasize solutions. We must have reserves, and I talk about this in my book, to back the currency. We must have physical consolidation. We must have productivity. We must have production if the economy is going to move. We must ring fence savings and deposits to minimize destruction of value. You know, there's nothing as frustrating and devastating as a woman or a man who worked as a teacher for 40 years, and all their savings are wiped out. After being a headmaster, for 50 years, you can't survive because the deposits are being destroyed. We must build confidence, we must build trust. Politically, we've had a crisis since 19, uh, 2017 because of the coup and the election in 2018, which was problematic, challenges around governance, lack of leadership, lack of statesmanship, and we are moving towards an election. What is the context? incarceration of opposition leaders, Scala and Garivume are inside. There are no reforms. The voters' role is not available for the opposition. We have a fraudulent and illegitimate delimitation framework. This is the context of the election. And obviously, that election is going to be problematic. Again, in my book, I emphasize solutions. We need a shared national vision. We need a shared economic prosperity framework. We need inclusive growth driven by good governance, legitimacy, macroeconomic stability, economic transformation, technology. Fourth industrial revolution, AI and robotics must be driving the economy. This is what we're pushing as the solutions and the ideas, the framework. We need a proper second republic. Zimbabwe is not a second republic. A second republic must be peaceful, democratic, and prosperous. We need a proper new dispensation. They claim to have a second republic. They claim to have a new dispensation, but a new dispensation is not declared, it is earned. It has not been earned in Zimbabwe. We must do that by having two things, a shared national vision, which is called a collective destination for the country. Where do you want to see our country in the year 2050? Can we have a shared national vision for South Africa, for the continent? Can we have a competitive national identity, the national brand? The Minister of, former Minister of Tourism is here, Zambi, used to drive that national brand there. 
national brand which is bought into by everyone, all political parties, civil society, the academy, and all the citizens, so that we can have a national brand and a national vision. What is the state of our society, the economy, and the politics? These are the answers. These are the ideas we want to put through. What do we do to achieve as a people? What do we want to achieve and how do we achieve it? Within a bounded time frame. The vision is the house on the top of the hill. The strategy is how you come from where you are in the valley to the top of the hill. And then you need execution, execution, execution and implementation matrix. Who is going to do what? When are they doing it? Where are the sources come from? What are the milestones? How do you define success? How do you measure success? And how do you feed back? That is the framework, the solution to Zimbabwe, the solution to South Africa. By the way, you don't have a national vision in South Africa. Lest you become exceptional and think that you're doing cool. You're not doing cool. NDP is ANC. When you say national vision, it must be shared by the ANC, by uh, EFF, by AFP, by the DA. Do you have a national vision which is shared by all political parties in South Africa? No, work on it. That's the framework. And then you might differ on how to get there. When I say American dream, it's neither Democratic or Republican. All of them share the American dream concept. They differ on how to get there. So we need a national vision for the continent, a national vision for South Africa, a national vision for Zimbabwe. Okay, and then of course we have our hexagonal branding. We must be known positively in tourism, in investment, in trade, governance. That's what we call the hexagonal branding, which is part of our brand identity. To develop Zimbabwe's reputation in order to improve the country's global community. These ideas that we're pushing in the book so that Zimbabwe can have a competitive identity. Why ideas we must offer an alternative vision and a compelling strategy for Zimbabwe, for Africa, for the global south? What do you want to see in the global south? What is your strategy to achieving that vision? How are you going to implement it? Provide an actionable, implementable, timelined, and well-resourced plan. And of course, implementation, and then monitoring performance, evaluating performance, and feeding back. We need to develop redemptive paradigms for Zimbabwe, for Africa, and the Global South. That's what we seek to do in the book. How is it structured? We have a rocky start to the GNU. You know, Mugabe thought we were in there to just entertain him. So in the first few cabinets, we had to make sure that we are clear that we are our own persons and so we had a rocky beginning, but we got there. You read the book. I don't want to preempt myself here. And then we started grappling with the national agenda. The two big issues were the economy and the politics. Under the politics, political reforms, and the constitution. The economy, I think we did fairly well. There was stability during the GNU, and the economy performed reasonably well. We did not do well on political reforms. Guilty as charged, but we're able to deliver the new constitution. We also, I was uh, lucky to spend a lot of time with Mugabe. I was very close to him, not because I sold out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, read the book. <laughs> read the book. <clears throat> Number one, Mugabe liked me because of one thing. Mugabe was an Anglophile. I went to Oxford, so Mugabe liked me because I went to Oxford. He was an Anglophile. Mugabe liked school, education. I'm a PhD from Oxford. Mugabe appreciated that. Then the other reason, I'm a history buff. I love history. And he likes telling stories. So I used to ask him, tell me about Andamanik's story. Tell me about Tongogara. Tell me about Chitepo. And he would so he liked that I was very keen to learn about history. There are many other good reasons in the, in the book. <laughs> the other one was I was very principled. Mutambara says no, it's a no. Mutambara says yes, it's a yes. My other friends would change when they get outside the meeting. So Mugabe knew with Mutambara, you know where you stand. Anyway, I was afforded an opportunity to have bilaterals, three hours, four hours with the man. So in the book, you're going to hear some interesting views which he never shared, but he shared with me. 
So you're very lucky. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then uh, the end game and so on. Some running themes in the book, Pan-Africanism, very important. Regional integration, very important. African agency, we need to be in charge. During COVID, we were shown that we have no agency. Our billionaires, Strive Masiwa and others, took their money to Europe and say, give us those vaccines, we are prepared to pay. And the Europeans said, no, not really. We want to keep vaccines for ourselves six times our needs. We need to be able to produce our own medicines. We can't just be depending on Europe and America. Anyway, African agents in many things. The discipline of gratitude, that one says, grateful people are happy people. And there are so many leaders who are not grateful and they end up in trouble. So anyway, there's a thesis there called the discipline of gratitude. Preserve the asset. The most important asset you have is your health. If your health goes away, if you die, that power, non-consequential. That education, gone. That money, gone. So take care of your physical health. And it's a thesis we push through the book called the Preserve the Asset. Technology is your friend. AI is your friend. You can't fight technology. You can't ban technology. Work with technology. Make it help you solve your problems. Technology is your friend. Just to emphasize this thing about integration, look at those numbers. Zimbabwe, $25 billion, 15, South Africa. These are not economies. I know South Africans are very arrogant. If you think you've got a good economy, you don't. It's too small, it's chicken change. Botswana, 2.4 million people, 41 billion dollars. These economies are not great. Look at that now, SADAC, 380 million people. That's an economy. Tripartite free trade area, that's an economy. Africa, even better. Before we look at Africa, look at the world. China, the ambassador of China is here. Dev Dimunyai, how are you doing there? <laughs> 1.44 billion people. <laughs> GDP, $19.9 trillion. That is China. For, that's an economy now. India, 1.41. By the way, the numbers between India and China are a tosser. Some people are saying India is overtaking China in terms of numbers, but just work with these numbers for now. GDP, $3.3 trillion. That's an economy. The U.S., 334 million people. GDP, 25.3. You know, how can little Botswana go and strike a deal with China, Zimbabwe, strike a deal. Let us come together in the African continent of free trade area. What are the numbers? 1.35 billion Africans. Collective GDP, $2.5 trillion. This is the Africa that should negotiate with China. This is the Africa that's negotiating with America. Can you imagine if I rock up and say, here I come, I'm the African. I speak on behalf of 1.35 billion people. And behind me, I have a GDP of $2.5 trillion. The Americans will listen to me, not out of love, out of economics. The Chinese will treat me well because they see the size of my market and my potential. We must, I'm dramatizing the importance of regional integration, not this dysfunctional, non-viable states, South Africa. Already he told us that South Africa is descending into uh, a failed state. <laughs> anyway, uh, the, the numbers are not great. Nigeria, the same. Look, just, where's, 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 where's Zimbabwe? Can you see Zimbabwe there? Can you see Malawi there? That is global GDP. We are not visible. We are too small. Africa is right there in the corner. I can see Germany. I can see China. I can see United States. I certainly cannot see Zimbabwe. So why would Zimbabwe, a non-visible country, go and negotiate with China? This is a dramatization of sizes of economies. If we go together as 1.4 billion Africans, $2.3 trillion GDP, maybe we can make sense. We're also pushing for what we call a cluster strategy in the book. Why don't you have a diamond cluster? Botswana, South Africa, DRC, Zimbabwe, Angola, working together as a diamond cluster. South Africa and Zimbabwe, who control 90% of platinum, platinum cluster, oil cluster, and so on, so that we can be able to be players. Revelations from the book, a few of them. 
You know, arbitrage is very bad. Arbitrage, is, this is why we're saying uh, one US dollars is 20 US dollars officially. On the black market, one to 200. Do you realize that even the pastor will not change their money on the official market? They'll go to the black market. They'll go to the parallel market. So even the pastors have been criminalized. The danger with criminalizing everyone, it says, we are all criminals. So it's a question of who is more criminal than the other. So people can go and steal because we're all criminals. So arbitrage is a problem in Zimbabwe. During the Gono years and now, where you have an official rate that says one US dollar is equal to 20 other TGS or you know, Zimbabwe money, and then on the parallel is 2,000. It's a terrible opportunity which makes everyone a criminal. Let me dramatize you the looting effect. You know, uh, under the Gono regime, and even now, but most under the Gono regime, you could take 10,000 US dollars, 10,000 big ones US dollars, and within a week, convert that into 2 million US dollars, not runs, US dollars. The rand is also failing, right? So 2 million US dollars. How do you do that? You take your 10,000 US dollars, you go to the parallel market, you buy uh, Zimbabwe dollars, you go to the central bank, you get the US at the official rate, you take those US dollars, you go back to the parallel market. If you do it two times, you can do it, you calculate it you'll be able to convert 10,000 US dollars into 2 million US dollars without work. Not you and I can do it, those who are connected to Gono, to Mangujga, to the Minister of Finance can do it. And that's how people made serious money in Zimbabwe under the Gono era. They're making it now with this two arbitrage there. Which brings me to the interesting point. Zanu PFL is don't have 99 year leases. They have title deeds. And, and go, go, go tell them. They are holding title deeds. How do they pay for the farms? They are holding title deeds. Read my book. <laughs> How do they do it? And also, Gabe had no faith in 99 leases. He believed in title. It's in the book. Now, how did they do it? They would chase a farmer from the farm, take the farm, and the farmer runs away to South Africa, to New Zealand, to Australia, and is living in a shack, living in a little room in Australia. They follow him or oh, her. Farmer, uh, how much is your farm worth? Oh, my farm was so beautiful. My farm was worth 15 million US dollars. And they say, ah, come on, you'll never get nothing. We'll never pay compensation anyway. How is two million? And the farmer is desperate. Two million? Yes, you said 15, but I can give you two. And the farmer is desperate. They take the two million, they hand over the title deeds, they sign on the dotted lines. And they don't tell anyone. <laughs> because if they tell somebody, they are part of the ZANU patronage. I know it's shocking, but I've got the facts. So what it means is, when you say Bona has 21 farms, <laughs> it's, it's not 99 year leases. She's holding title. Those chaps in there, vice president, army commander, judges, they don't have 99 leases. They have title. How did they pay for the title? Arbitrage. Take 10,000 US dollars, convert it to 2 million US dollars, you pay for your farm. And also we now know about the gold mafia so they could make money from God. It's a travesty of justice because the idea was that nine year leases are the, but they are only for the unimportant. They are only for the, uh, but it's a major issue I raise in there and I prove that the ZANU PF elites are not holding on to nine year leases, they are holding on to title. Go figure. And of course we have views from the struggle, revisited, and when I'm now running to conclusion now, you know, when we say documentation, we need the written word, we need videos or footage, we need pictures and other artifacts. History is complicated. And also young people don't just read. They want to watch YouTube. So you must create videos, you must create pictures to educate. And uh, we'll share a bit around the, work, uh, on the Constitution, a bit of video there and some pictures, and then we conclude. Let's see whether this thing will work. 
The Constitutional Select Committee led the process, holding public hearings and consultations over the making of a new constitution for Zimbabwe. Two all stakeholders conferences were held, and the draft was produced amid power struggles among the political players. The intervention of principles to the global political agreement gave way to the referendum. We don't write a constitution for today. We write a constitution for posterity, for future generations. As a country, we have invested so much in this process, in both financial and material terms, if indeed in time terms. We are the ones who agreed that no, we shall not have Kariba. We must now have a people-driven constitution. This set the stage for approval by the electorate, parliament, and now it has been signed into law. I think we can all say today is a great day for our country. For the first time in the history of this country, we have a constitution that we've authored on our own without the facilitation of foreigners. This is a dramatic improvement from Lancaster House. I think that is what we should celebrate today, that Zimbabweans have come together and produced a constitution which will define the trajectory of our country. As we do this celebration, for me, we must pick up a few lessons. The first one says, why have we succeeded? Why were we able to deliver a constitution? We were able to do so by emphasizing that which unites us and de-emphasizing our differences. We were able to achieve this constitution, Your Excellency, by working together, by cooperating among ourselves, by putting Zimbabwe first, by pushing a team. And where you can all see that later. Now, pictorially, you see, we worked, we are very thankful to South Africa, worked with President um, Becky first, then Mohandi, and then during the uh, third volume, it was President Zuma. He was very critical and very useful to our situation there. The Chinese, we told the Chinese, we don't want you to come and take raw materials from our continent. We want you to set up beneficiation in manufacturing on the continent. But of course, we're now gone. They, they do not, they're not doing resource-based uh, extraction now. But it's important that you understand that it's important the Chinese, the Chinese are not Father Christmas. They're business people. So it's up to us to be organized as Africans so that we can extract better deals which will benefit the continent. SADAC is very important to us, and so we have a lot of uh, SADAC work there. And then the spouse must play a low. Uh, that spouse here is a CEO and uh, sitting on three boards. So sometimes I go to New York uh, carrying the bags, you know. And uh, the African Americans are important for us, and we, we have a lot of ideas there from the African struggles. And then unity, look at that. That's ZANU PF, MDC Shangira, and ourselves working together. Zimbabweans can work together. We've done it before. Again, we are friendly, not because they're sold out, but because there was respect, which was mutual. And also, Mugabe used to say, a PhD in rocket science. He was intimidated by the PhD. So that worked in my favor. And then this is the day we signed the Constitution. And uh, the, uh, the new Constitution, which is now 2013 now, and um, so, again, we are saying documentation is more than writing. Show us some pictures. Show us some uh, examples of what is going on. That is uh, Chamisa, who is a key player now in Zimbabwe. Um, Madam Kupe, culture again. We have Mafumo there and Mutukudzi. So the, the interplay between politics and society and arts and culture and soccer, of course, 2010, with our friend uh, Blatter there. The World Economic Forum gave us exposure to some of these fellas here. Uh, again, we're saying that ideas are not local, they're global. 
So what, what, what we should push for around climate change, energy crisis, and so on must be global and must be involved with everyone. Again, you get some stories about how people were killed. Mujuru. I was one of the people that saw that dead body. Read my book. And also, I'll tell you Mugabe's attitude. Read my book. <coughs> and our friends, our friend Edgar Tekere there, and our Muchangwa, and the current one. We used to talk. We have some strong views and some good views about him in the book. Mangoma, Mpofu, Munangagwa there, you know. And um, uh, Kasuku Erasi is here. Kasuku Ire. We used to work together. He's uh, in a bit of trouble now, but uh, it's okay. <laughs> and with Zembi, Mr. Zembi is here. I've already met Mr. Zembi. Uh, we're working together. You can see the unity nation there. Uh, Gono. Uh, oh, and that one too. We, we, we spent a lot of time together. We also deal with the coup plotters. We could see they were making a coup, but we couldn't tell where it was coming from. They were friendly. Uh, but uh, they took over eventually and ran in the country. And that's Chamisa, the president of the uh, C now, Maduku. All we are saying is, oh, and by the way, we actually attended the coup presidential appointment. You need to ask us why we did that. Read the book. <laughs> That's Chamisa and me attending the illegal presidential installment. <laughs> why did we do it? Read the book. <laughs> and that's me there. That's Chamisa congratulating Munangagwa. And I'm like, yeah. Why did we do this? Read the book. <laughs> okay, anyway. Um, now, Chris, am I done now? Am I done now with volume three? Is this the end? And then UJ, of course, we've got UJ now in the picture. Uh, the end of the old man, gone. Again, emphasis on the, on the results. Am I done? No. no. Am I done? No. So Certainly not. not speaking. <laughs> <laughs> now, what we're saying is uh, we should never stop writing. Uh, I'm just tell you what I'm working on now. I'm working on what is called the age of the story from 1640 AD to the present. <laughs> now this time, Chris, I'm not sharing any ideas or solutions. It's just a plain story. No fancy ideas and solutions. I'm not trying to save the world. I'm just telling my story, you know, starting from 10 generations above my father. Huh? Number one to 10. And to 10... Generations above my father. So my father's number 11, and yours truly number 12. I'm going to cover, in the first three, four chapters, I won't be there. It'll be other people. Then I'm born, and then it starts happening. <laughs> How did we get to 20? <laughs> we did an estimation. I'm just trying to encourage you to document your history. That's my great-grandfather. 12 wives, 43 children. And you just says I must only have one. <laughs> First chancellor. <laughs> you have other <laughs> We're grateful they So, uh, you know, my rights have been taken away from me. Anyway, I'm going to talk about all that in the next project uh, and so on. But this is a, the future work. Mother, let's go to the chapel and get married. That's my father and mother. And what happened? We're now in the village. Very quash yogurt. No food. <laughs> what happened? Four kids. I'm the one there. With, uh, with Kwashioka. <laughs> but guess what? Four out of four PhDs. PhD biology, PhD pharmacy, PhD economics, and yours truly. What happened? Read my future book. <laughs> anyway, I'm done. What I'm simply saying is, it's important to document. Write your story. We must write. We must document. I thank you so very much for this opportunity. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, VC, I should actually tell you, I mean, just in terms of that um, speculative, uh, speculative question you ask, he used to wear, what did you say? Bermuda. Bell bottle. Bell bottle. <laughs> he, he used to wear that. He used to wear dungarees. And believe it or not, he used to have an afro. 
at some point. Um, uh, I was there, but but uh, Prof. Mutambara, I think that was, I mean, it it was it was incredible how you weaved a very serious political narrative about the Zimbabwean modern political story, uh, place it in a continental but especially global context, but also make the case for ideas, ideational power, documentation. You emphasized it over and over uh, again. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm certainly going to read it, and I'm going to start with the part on the non-coup. Coup. That's how we described it on the uh, on our group, uh, Prof. Munya, you will remember. The non-coup. Coup. So the African Union VC, as you know, um, you do a lot of work on continental affairs. Prof. Tia, the, the, the AU actually has a doctrine um, on, uh, on unconstitutional changes of government. The Zimbabweans got it right to actually get the people to walk with them to the palace, follow the army to go and stage the coup, never sanctioned, never expelled. Powerful Egypt was expelled when they did the coup against President, late President um, Morsi. A uh, fascinating story. And let me, let me conclude by sticking my neck out. I was fascinated by you describing President Mugabe as an Anglophile. And I've always said to, um, to people, one of the reasons why President Mugabe and President Mbeki connected so well is precisely because of that notion. But the reason why one of the greatest achievements of Robert Mugabe until things went terribly wrong, was the education system he put in place, was precisely because he, he, he was fascinated about how such a small population in a small island on the Atlantic could colonize the entire world to the extent that they could say the sun never sets on the British Empire. And what did he do? Not outcomes-based education, changed the curriculum 25 times in less than 10 years, but kept the A-level and the O-level system, changed the curriculum. There's something to learn from the enemy. If they can do this, <laughs> if they could run an empire stretching from Papua New Guinea right to Canada, maybe, maybe there's something to be said. That was fascinating, Prof. We're looking forward, and we're certainly looking forward to volume five, <laughs> where you conclude with the, with, with the University of Johannesburg. <laughs> you know? Everything lead to the climax. Um, thanks for sharing your insights. Uh, we should learn and we South Africans should really become less parochial and take the stories of others very seriously, certainly our fellow Africans. Professor Naidu, Vice Dean, over to you. Oh, no, 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 Dean, Dean, Dean. <laughs> there was now a career limiting statement. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Dean of the Faculty <laughs> of Humanities. Dean, over to you. Thank you so much, Prof. Mutumbara. I think that was a fantastic and very inspiring presentation. Um, Prof. Mpedi, Prof. Landsberg, Prof. Thea Devet, Dr. Kaziboni, thank you for all organizing this uh, very, very important session. So I want to agree, thank you. Uh, Never stop writing. That's a great lesson for all of us. Never stop writing. So when Prof, uh, well, warmest congratulations on the publishing of this extraordinary book. It is extraordinary in so many different ways. When I agreed to say a few words, I said to Prof Motambara, I need a copy of your book. Please, will you give me a copy? Let me just read through it quickly and uh, <laughs> get ready. get ready for this presentation. So let me see what I can summarize in a couple of hours. And then he brings me this big book, <laughs> 720 pages. And he says, this is volume three. There's a volume <laughs> one and two. So I certainly didn't finish volume one, two, and three over the weekend. And I think to do justice to the book, I'm going to need 720 minutes, please, to go through all the anecdotes and the detail that is in it. So I just want to say, well, I'm going to just give you a sound bite because there's a whole lot of us here, and I think 
some are better prepared than others, and I've... Uh, um, so well done, I would say, on a three-volume series that offers a very detailed description of one's experiences. It's your life experiences, deep analysis, and deep reflections. The book is deeply reflective. And uh, as I said, I, I would really need a lot of time to do justice to this particular book. So the book offers a political history and a progressive, ethical, and comprehensive vision for change by taking us on a journey with one particular key man, and that's Arthur Mutambara. The journey is built piece by piece, to my mind, like it's constructed by an engineer. You know, different parts coming together so wonderfully. It has lots of anec anecdotes, but also solid coverage of matters from the perspective of an insider. Each episode or story is intended to be solution orientated. And I like the sentiments that just flow in at different points, like let us get down to work as Team Zimbabwe. We must be masters of our destiny. So there are bold views and positions expressed throughout the book. And I, I heard you say so emphatically just now, who's writing the story of Africa? You know, he's asking um, who is writing the story? So the book is fascinating for those who want to better understand Zimbabwean politics and dynamics and the African continental challenges. But I enjoyed, I enjoyed all the intriguing insights. Sometimes there's, there's almost information you don't get from anywhere else, like the insights into Robert Mugabe, uh, the person, and the behind the scenes encounters with Robert Mugabe, and your description of him and his Machiavellian characteristics. I found that quite fascinating. So whilst there are bold moments in the book and um, strong and emphatic and, and deep sentiments, I was also touched by the way you describe some of the other very uh, dark moments in Zimbabwean history, like you talk about with sensitivity, the, the story of Susan Swangarai's death is told and how you dealt with it, and then to the way the Prime Minister Morgan Swangarai's death is dealt with. I appreciated your reflections on China, SADC, the need for peace, pan-Africanism, even 4IR, social media, and the detailed unraveling of issues related to the government of national unity. And I, I think that I draw a lot of your insights on the futures of young people. There's a lot of messages there and what the challenges are for the next generation of um, Zimbabwean leadership. I also think your chapter on women, women, uh, womenomic, women, womenomics, you know, the understanding, investing in women as smart economics. I thought that was quite an intriguing chapter. And I would say we can treat that as prescribed lead, uh, reading. Let the women uh, engage with that chapter. I think there's a lot of um, valuable insights. When I looked at that chapter on smart economics and gender, I was just th thinking about your ideas about writing textbooks. And now only did I understand why you wanted to write that textbook because the content that we work through and teach our students comes from elsewhere. And in some ways, we criticize it ourselves for not being sufficiently grounded in our day-to-day -day lives and our own reality. So I, was, I think now maybe I would support that particular initiative. Don't worry about the DHET <coughs> units. But I think thinking about critical textbooks and finding a way of doing it would be quite valuable for our context our students in this current moment in our history. So with, with respect to the Zimbabwean story, you say at different points that a vision is needed, a game plan, a national strategy, and the words vision, thought leadership, and dream come up throughout the book, and they are quite inspirational and moving. In writing the histories though, let's have some critical reflections on the mistakes made and how we can redirect our paths instead of slipping into deeper disasters. So in walking this path as Deputy Prime Minister, as an academic and as an intellectual, you've brought along your family. 
So I heard you say the spouse must play her role. I quickly wrote it down so I wouldn't forget that you said that. And I see your photographs. Your wife, Jackie, is all over, featuring so firmly within them. Um, so you bring in your wife, Jackie, and your two sons. So the book then is deeply personal, intellectual, and inspirational. And we congratulate you once again for bringing it together with such passion and forthrightness. And I'd like to end by reading what I consider to be a central message that I can relate to and use for a wider audience grappling with the intricacies of disillusionment and failure, precisely what Prof. Landsberg brought to this context today. Uh, so Prof. Butambara says at the end of a public dialogue on who owns SADAC, he says, I hope in the next two days you will be proactive and solution-driven rather than have a gripe session. Do not just complain and moan, as the great African-American activist Florence Kennedy taught us, don't agonize, organize. Do not just offer a critique of SADAC, give us answers that will shape the way forward. Let us be solution-focused, answers-driven, and not just be complainers. The future of SADAC is in your beautiful African hands. And for me, that is a message that the book uh, brings forth. Um, so thank you for this refreshing, focused, and future-orientated book. It'll certainly make its mark as important African scholarship in thought leadership. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dean. Some, some, some really wonderful insights there. And it seems to me um, you only managed to skip five pages of the 720 because <laughs> there was quite a, a comprehensive and very important um, contribution um, uh, by the Dean. And uh, Prof. Mutambara, I, I, I would actually say, and I'm certainly going to take up the challenge uh, of, of doing a review um, of, of the book, but don't expect me to be too kind to you all the time. Um, so thanks for that, um, Dean. Um, Dr. Nguane, Trevor, old friend, comrade, critique, critic, everything. Trevor, welcome. Always good to see you. Thanks, thanks, Chris. Uh, thank you very much. <coughs> uh, what an honor. Uh, this is a true son of the soil, uh, Comrade Mutambara, Professor Mutambara. I first met him, uh, we had a meeting, we had the anti-privatization forum, uh, I think a decade ago, we were fighting against privatization. I think he was uh, deputy uh, prime minister, but he came and spent uh, a whole afternoon with us. It was uh, amazing. So here is a man of action. Uh, he has seen it all. I think you also. And uh, indeed, he's got a story to tell. He's reached the pinnacle of academic achievement, all his degrees, his uh, fellowships. But he also reached the highest office in government in Zimbabwe. Of course, you can't reach the very top as long as Mukabe is alive. So, you know, I can't blame him. <laughs> So the book, uh, it's amazing. He's a visionary, so he's always looking ahead, you know, um, where we're going, a map. Uh, in search of uh, the elusive Zimbabwean dream, I think uh, many of us here would agree, we are also in search of the elusive South African dream. I don't know, did it die with Mandela? In search of the elusive African dream. <clears throat> Indeed, the global dream. <clears throat> so uh, I enjoy the book and uh, the pictures. Uh, Comrade Mutambara showed you the pictures. Uh, like Camilla, well, my problem is I was looking at the pictures. I wish I had read the text. <laughs> <clears throat> and then, of course, uh, I was happy to see a picture of uh, Victoria Chitepo and her daughter, um, Chogo. Uh, so uh, they are part of my family. So I was really, 
uh, intrigued and happy. So I know that uh, there are stories about Mugabe, so I can't really tell you stories about uh, what my aunt uh, said about Mugabe. I'll just tell you how it would start. Oh, Robert! <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and then she'd tell us what happened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, you can imagine Mugabe, you know, being Robert. Yeah, I'm Robert. So uh, I was really intrigued by, uh, especially, I think the, the forward to something you talk about, the six, seven things which you believe uh, Zimbabwe should strive for. So uh, elements of your dream, of the dream for Zimbabwe. For Africa, I think you say it's a dream for the global south. Peace, equality, stability, democracy, inclusive economic growth, shared prosperity. So I think uh, these seven elements, pillars, uh, if you are EFF, uh, they are actually uh, can be shared with everyone. Yeah. And uh, I believe right across the ideological spectrum. So it's a dream we can all agree to. Of course, the book is about what is stopping the dream becoming a reality. So I think here, someone said, I think, uh, Chris, so here uh, in uh, Mutambara, we find the unity of theory and practice. So he's tested it. He's writing about it. Action, reflection. And then he identifies a number of problems, internal and external, to Zimbabwe, to Africa, to the global south. Of course, we cannot forget how we came to be where we are. Colonialism, imperialism, slavery. So those things we cannot just shake off, we have to address. But we also find leaders, classes, interests, vested interests, who maybe hide behind that and uh, appropriate responsibility for running uh, their countries to the ground. So I think that uh, uh, Comrade Mutambara, the professor, has uh, actually put his uh, finger on the nail there. Now, there are, so it's easy for me because there are so many similarities between what's happening in Zimbabwe and what's happening in South Africa. Uh, in fact, I think the fate of the two countries are inseparable. And uh, Mutambara argues that we need regionalism. Uh, he resuscitates or invokes that vision of Kwame Nkrumah, the United States of Africa. Uh, now, people, I don't know, it's you, Chris, you are guilty of this. You talk about Zimbabwezation. <laughs> yes, so this is uh, an illusion which uh, South Africans have got. You know, they'll say, no, you know, what, what happened in Zimbabwe is only the showing shots. The real movie will be South Africa. No, it's not as if something bad happened across the Limpompo. Yeah, our fates are so interlinked. Can you see? I mean, we are neighbors, but are we good neighbors? I mean, yes, during the national liberation struggle, there was solidarity. But post-independence, did we maintain our good neighborliness? Well, I can't accuse uh, Zimbabwe of anything. I can talk about my own country, South Africa. I don't see good neighborliness. A whole period, you will know, Chris, international relations of quiet diplomacy. Things are going bad in your neighbor's house. You just keep quiet and uh, put your, your, your head uh, under the table. Today, we have got xenophobia. After contributing to the destruction, doing nothing about our neighbor having a hard time, now we turn around and start othering Zimbabweans. Go back home. We don't want you. This is wrong. We are not good neighbors. The worst part now, because uh, I heard you talk about um, uh, the crocodiles, Nangakwa's helicopters. Yeah. I don't know. If, if uh, Nangakwa is the crocodile, what was Mugabe? I mean, I don't... Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so uh, the president of uh, Zimbabwe says the, he got these helicopters from Russia because whenever there are disasters, 
uh, he has to ask South Africa to help. Yeah, so that's the issue. But now, what he's forgetting is that these uh, extreme weather patterns, such as Cyclone Idai, you know, all these rain bombs falling in Zimbabwe, people dying in Malawi, the responsibility lies with South Africa. Who is the biggest emitter of carbon in Africa, indeed, in the world? Yeah, so basically, we are not doing Zimbabwe a favor when we send helicopters to rescue them during those extreme weather patterns. We are paying reparations because all the climate change em uh, emanates from our country. And then, of course, uh, what I like about the book uh, is what uh, Camila mentioned about self-correction. So, you know, the book is almost like a mirror. So he told us at one point he believed in the one-party state. Now he reflected. So many people don't want to see themselves in the mirror. Uh, there are too many blemishes. But I think that all leaders, all good leaders, all countries, all revolutions must engage in constructive self-criticism. Of course, we've, we have to fight against greed, uh, against power mongering. Here, I remember Neville Alexander saying, enough is a feast. So when you've had enough, when your stomach is full, you don't have to get another farm, another farm, another farm. I think that is the spirit of capitalism, of greed. You know, grow, grow, accumulate, accumulate. That's the law and the prophets. So I think uh, in trying to build a pan-Africanist uh, society of solidarity, uh, we have to indeed confront the problem of capitalism because it is capitalism which, whose structures encourage, generate this greed for profit. But uh, thank you very much, uh, Comrade Mutambara. You've done uh, a good job. Our children, our children's children will read this book, learn something, and know that at some time there was a dream for Zimbabwe. I hope by that time uh, it will be a dream for Africa, for the whole world. Thank you. Dr. Trevor, thank you very much for, that, um, for those insights. And um, I, I, I like your description of um, almost the praxis of Mutambara and, and the leadership style uh, and attributes of the man, uh, a visionary, servant, transformational thought leader, and very radical at times. I'm not sure whether other artists becoming more radical as he's aging or, 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 or less so. Um, just a bit of advice, uh, Dr. Trevor. Uh, don't criticize the MC next time. I mean, it's not nice. <laughs> I mean, just, I mean, don't, don't play with your future invitations. <laughs> but well done, well done, Trev. Um, and, and, and well done to, to you and your contributions about the Soweto Electricity Crisis um, Committee. We're following it very closely. Um, Dr. Nkosana Moyo, please, we beg you. Uh, you know the man. You've worked with him. Please tell some tales on the man as well. <laughs> I mean, it, it can't be that Arthur is just this perfect uh, a practitioner, activist, um, scholar. Tell us some tales about him as well. Well done. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. I didn't go to Oxford, so I'm not going to comply with any of those. <laughs> I, I believe in not washing our dirty laundry in public, okay? So that's where I'll start from. When, when I talked to the prof here, Arthur, if, if I may call you that, and I asked him how much time I had to, to give my comments, he says five minutes. So I figured, really, I cannot get into the substance of the book. I read the book. I went, took the trouble to go fetch it and read it. But my advice would be, I think we should create an opportunity for us to debate the ideas proffered and the solutions. We can't do it here. We can't do justice here. But I think it's, it is also correct to load Arthur with documentation. I absolutely agree with you. If you don't document, we don't have a journey of the history. But 
please, I think we also shouldn't get too carried away. If all the people sitting in this room were professors, could you imagine what would happen? So some of us are good at telling stories and documentation. Allow some of us to read, okay? <laughs> don't, don't, don't force us all to be writers. Some of us will be okay reading and analyzing and critiquing, but don't force us to, to document. But absolutely, having said that, I think the, you know, the reason why we're having problems with fake news today is because documentation is important. And if we want our people, our youth, to believe in our own narrative, they will not do that without us documenting. But let's, let it be quality documentation. Let's leave those who are good at it, those who are good at storytelling, to do it for all of us. And then we'll have quality products, which we can use. But I don't think we can ignore the fact. If we don't get our good people to do that, other people will influence what we think and do. That's just inevitable. So we have to do it. Having said that, then, the issue of uh, ideas and solutions, I think that's a conversation for another day. But the link between the two, for me, is so important, and I often wonder, I want to use an example to illustrate how, how important this is. I have read a little, I'm a physicist by training, so I'm not a reader, I'm not a writer in that sense. I write equations. But I know a little bit about how the labor market was developed in Southern Africa. And it often puzzles me how we don't link that history with how we try to solve unemployment today. It's like we totally disconnected from the history of how the labor market was artificially created, and we're so caught up in it, we appear not to understand that the solution actually might come from us understanding and then departing from that particular construct. So importance of documentation. But documentation with analysis. Let's not just read. Let's read, analyze, understand, and let's not just believe what we read either. Let's be critical of what we read. Then we'll get value from that documentation. I think, to be honest with you, given that I'm not the first speaker, all that needs to be said has been said. Continue writing, I'll continue reading. <laughs> Uh, th thanks, Dr. Moyo. Um, we'll, we'll certainly take you up on that uh, offer you made to have a debate with Arthur uh, and for us to create a platform. It is a book launch. We're celebrating um, certainly a profound uh, and colossal contribution. But I think it, it'll be really great to even have a platform, um, a platform comprising of, 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 of Zimbabweans coming from different vantage, vantage points to, to, to have a debate with Professor Mutambara. Thanks, uh, Dr. Moyo. Uh, yeah, I'm told it's not um, politically very correct and it's not uh, gendered very well, but uh, boss lady, <laughs> Prof. Graham. On my way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, change is so profound, you have to call your former students Boss lady. <laughs> thanks so much, Prof Landsberg, an excellent teacher. Um, thanks so much, so much, Prof Mutambara, for inviting me to be on the panel today. I really appreciate that you thought of me to be here. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to read your book. Um, I didn't read every single line, I've got to confess, Prof, but I read as much as I could. And I just want to start by saying, you know, Prof, I'm a vice dean of teaching and learning, but my discipline is international relations. So I'm going to try and talk from a perspective or a lens of IR and teaching and learning a little bit about your book and what it meant to me when I read it. And I'm going to start by saying this morning, VC, you were talking about the importance of leadership in an organization. And in IR theory, the state remains the highest authority in global politics. And those who are at the helm have such an opportunity to have effective influence globally. So you can say that leaders can shepherd a state, they can enforce rules, they can steer a state, or they can do nothing. But what they must do <laughs> is account for their leadership decisions. And this text is such a thought-provoking account of this exact exercise. You are a force of nature. You are an effective communicator, and it comes across in your writing. And Prof, I know why you did that as well, because you talk about revisiting Marx's definition of the means of production. 
And you say it's not just about land, etc. It's also about the power of communication and the use of force, and the force of technology and the use of technology. And you are a force. You have such a unique voice and understanding of context in this book, and it comes across in every single page. I also enjoyed looking at the pictures, I have to confess. It was one of the first things I did, and I enjoyed seeing that you care about your family enough to have them appear over and over again in the book. It was wonderful to see. And what this book does is it showcases all of your talents. <laughs> you're very skilled. I'm sorry, Prof Landsberg, there are more compliments coming this way. <laughs> but you're very skilled in terms of projecting, anticipating. You know what? You're a great writer because you're a great observer of people. It's clear. You can anticipate, you can project, you can strategize, and most importantly, you recognize meaningful moments, and then you take advantage of them. So I'm just going to quickly draw everybody's attention to one specific opportunity where you did this. So, Prof, you'll remember this on page 28 for those who will be buying the book after this, where you talk about the unscheduled panel that almost didn't happen at the World Economic Forum in May in Tanzania in 2010. And this is where, through your communication or effective communication, you managed to get three leaders together to talk about Zimbabwe. It was never going to happen. And you were criticized at the time. So George Tarumba basically later wrote about this saying, Arthur Mutambara was either foolhardy or a genius to propose such a successful platform to President Robert Mugabe. And you say, um, really? What stark choices? So you're either foolhardy or a genius. Am I allowed to select between the two rationales, or is it for others to choose or determine? Quite comical indeed. So that really stood out for me. It was such a fascinating way for you to describe an event where you were really instrumental in bringing together such an important group of people, and it actually really was a success. And in IR theory, thought leadership is such an important thing. So we are perhaps lacking a little bit in that, in that respect in our country at the moment, but not just our country, across the world. The UK is lacking in thought leadership. There's a vacuum, there's a void of people that are bringing insightful decisions to the fore. But what your book reveals to us is that thoughtful leadership plays a crucial role. It must play a crucial role in Zimbabwe's development and progress by fostering innovation, driving change, and shaping the national discourse. We know, you've just revealed and others have revealed, the complex socioeconomic and political challenges that come with this country. And thought leadership must be a catalyst for transformation and the generation of new ideas. From a teaching perspective, I'm just looking across at two of my former students sitting in the back row there. And I'm thinking, when I was teaching international relations to you all those years ago when you were in your first year, what a wonderful thing it would have been to use this text as a way to showcase the theory of IR and the practice of IR and how the two can be brought together so beautifully. You may not be a political scientist, you may be a roboticist, etc., and other, have other talents, but you reflect in this book in a very significant way how the theory of international relations can be depicted in practice. And you do it, as Prof. Naidu said, in such a beautiful way through your detailed narratives and then other snippets, sound bites of genius or just your views about certain things. And I think, as you recall, you just said now, this young generation doesn't like to read. And I think this kind of book is the, exactly the right thing for them because of these sound bites, because of these snippets. When I opened the book to start reading last week, I couldn't put it down and I had to get on with my other duties. And it was getting in the way because I couldn't put it down. It really is a fascinating exercise in your political memoirs. I'm going to say insightful, full of intelligence, full of thinking and recommendations on the way forward. In politics, it's very important to have autobiographies because... We need to know how to reflect on the most important matters. Politics is a serious business, and we need to know from people who have actually been there and done the job. So you have to document, as you said. I'm so glad you've done so. So this is a very personal account of a very driven man and your ideas for a future that you believe is the right future. It reveals your personality, your thinking, very candid reflections of your time in office and beyond outside of that time from rousing speeches that are extremely funny and extremely enthralling to detailed narratives to photos and policy recommendations. You really have it all. You've catered for all markets in this book. And the reason why autobiographies of political leaders are so important for IR is because of the historical insight. We don't want to lose it. When people don't write about their memoirs, we lose it because other people reflect on your story and they may remember it differently and they have their own views of how it went, but you know yourself. And so historical insight is so important. It must be documented. 
personal and leadership development, for transparency and accountability, for humanizing leaders, and for legacy and influence. All of these things are important for autobiographies and politi for political leaders to write autobiographies. What they do is they bring the I into international relations, and that's the whole point. So you're making a real case for autobiographies going forward. You're present in every sentence, as I said before, and there's this really wonderful quote, and I forget now, unfortunately, where I, I heard it, but the business of life is the acquisition of memories. Politics is a serious business, and this is your acquisition of memories for all of us to refer to going forward. So I just want to say congratulations to you again for this third volume. It's an inspiring read, and you've added firmly to the documentation and knowledge production of the African agenda and what that means. It's inspiring. It's full of first-hand accounts. People must read it. Your voice is so apparent. It's so important for strategizing in politics, but very importantly for knowledge production in international relations. So congratulations, Prof. So, so Prof, just, just remind me, what did you say? You said, sorry, Prof Landsberg, the what is going to him tonight? No, 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 no. I'm not craving after attention. Please don't take, don't, don't take us seriously on that point. I like the point you made, though. He's not a political scientist, but he's certainly a scientist who dabbled into politics. I mean, that, that much is true uh, and did a, a fantastic job uh, of that. But I'm serious when I describe Prof. Uh, Mutambara as a scholar, practitioner, activist. And VC, I will even go to the extent of saying, uh, by the way Prof. Mutambara's presentation was delivered tonight, I mean, I wouldn't like put it past him that that could very well have been his manifesto that he released tonight. <laughs> and, and thanks uh, uh, very much. Uh, you know, Paulo Frey said, the student shall become the professor, and the professor shall become the student. Thank you very much, uh, professor. Uh, I shall remain your student. Dave, thank you. Uh, congratulations on the upgrade. I mean, Arthur said, you the Chinese ambassador. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Ambassador Monyai. Vice Chancellor, um, our own Dean and Vice Dean, all distinguished uh, guests, ladies and gentlemen, comrades and friends. I, I, I really, uh, to be the last speaker, I think it's quite, I don't know if the last speaker is here. The last call, oh, then, then I'm, I'm, I'm in good shape. I really did not know where to start because um, I've read volume one, volume two, and I'm really deep into volume uh, three. And uh, so I'll say a few things because we'll do a proper critical. I'll be very kind to you uh, on this platform uh, but the review, uh, particularly on volume three, uh, I won't be as kind as I'm on volume one and two, because volume three, you are an actor. Um, but let me say a few things. Uh, two British um, personalities that are associated with what I'm going to say. First is Cecil John Rhodes, associated with you through the scholarship. Um, his last words were, <coughs> I think the previous vice chancellor quoted them here, uh, so much to do and so little time. Uh, at age of 47, 48, when he passed away, he had a dream, his own dream. And the, uh, the, the second one is Churchill. Why am I trying to drag Churchill with you um, is the beauty of the work that you have done, uh, even though you are not anyway directly associated with Churchill. Churchill was asked, uh, Prime Minister, how will history remember you? Um, his answer was very simple. Uh, he said, oh, well, history will be so kind to me 
it will be so favorable uh, to me. And they were wondering, why is he saying so? Uh, he say, the answer was very simple. Is it because I'm writing it? Um, if you look at the history of Churchill, um, he, in a way, <laughs> it's not a uh, First World War, Second World War, I mean, he was here. Um, terrible things that he did. But the history um, that he was able to write, was able to document, archive his history in a, in a nice. So the notion of archiving history it's, and personal history is quite important. And I think uh, in my generation, of which uh, we are in the same generation, three years senior than me, um, is that I haven't come across anyone who is able to archive personal history as, as, as you are doing. That in itself is a, one of the greatest achievements that I think uh, we need to uh, learn more. How did I come to, uh, I thought maybe in the five minutes I should just speak much more, how did I come across Arthur and the volumes? Just, uh, I'll use different lenses. Uh, that I knew Arthur as way back. I was fortunate enough anyway. I stayed in Zimbabwe for 10 years. And uh, the uh, part of where Arthur comes from, that's where I went to a boarding school. Uh, not very far, it's about 100 k's uh, from his homestead. Um, he comes from a very important place, an epicenter of the struggle uh, of liberation at the border with uh, Zimbabwe. Um, as a matter of fact, Arthur could spend um, uh, lunch in the Mozambique and, 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 and dinner uh, in Zimbabwe with a small stream of uh, water. I've been there. I have seen uh, the area in a way that produced Arthur. Um, a struggle of liberation was fought along that border uh, fiercely. And therefore, Arthur, it, um, as he uh, grew up, uh, produced a person that observed land, um, the history that is so rich about his own family. Um, in the Marxist language that you use, Arthur is a kulax. <laughs> <laughs> they own land, uh, traditional, so small farmers. So, I mean, a better way to use it's a kulax. I won't be surprised that he has goats that he's uh, farming um, at the moment. So, uh, I, I knew of Arthur uh, for the mere fact that while I was in Zimbabwe in the 10 years I stayed, it was a turning moment. Um, of 1980, uh, one of the most fascinating decade, um, the end of the Cold War. And here we are uh, talking about uh, volume three at the beginning of yet another fierce Cold War uh, 2.0 that is starting as we speak. And therefore, I think the journey that Arthur uh, talks about, even though it's Zimbabwe, it's so rich at the regional a continental and global, that he has managed to uh, document that in Zimbabwe, his home state, um, the struggles uh, of liberation up to being part. Um, he, on his graduation, uh, he refused to be kept by, vice, uh, by the chancellor. Um, and um, uh, yet he... Um, saved with him at the same time. So it's a fascinating uh, record. But face to face to know Arthur, it was through Adeke Adibajo and Professor Chris Lansbeck. It was in 2001, 2002, the Botswana trip. I think I traveled with you. Uh, the fascinating part of that trip in Botswana, I, don't, it was, I think it was in volume two, uh, you captured that. It was here Arthur coming from the US, uh, and there was another lady 
uh, in our group. So we were seated. I remember talking about other friends that you have to be very careful in the seminars we go to, that the friend you are speaking to tomorrow will be the president. Um, so it was Arthur and Jendai Fraser. Um, the Bush uh, elections had just happened. So Jendai Fraser became uh, the ambassador of US to South Africa. And within few months, Arthur became the deputy uh, prime minister uh, of Zimbabwe. The fascinating part was that what we were discussing and what we observed coming directly to uh, volume uh, three is that uh, it's something that we observed through, uh, followed it quite closely, uh, observed the elections, and what the book does and the uh, documentation is to give us certain elements that we're not privy to. Um, we were right there to observe those elections and had the privilege of meeting uh, some of these actors. But what the book does, I mean, he gives us certain statements, certain views that when you look at it from others' lenses, you understand the issue much more better. It makes more sense uh, to hear. However, I think, uh, Chair, as we are required to do as scholars, as I'm reading, would to write a serious um, book review uh, in a journal that the vice chancellor will be happy to hear because it brings uh, units um, where we engage uh, the issues uh, much more thorough. But this is an excellent book that we need, uh, that the story is not just told in words, the pictures themselves. Uh, ex things that we undermine most of the time uh, is just a picture. Um, but the manner in which he puts those pictures together, it tells a much more deeper story. Um, I think the value of the book in the next 50, 100 years, it will be much more, even much more uh, expensive as it is uh, today. So congratulations, Chair. I know we are pressed on time. These are my few uh, comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, Churchill and Cecil Rhodes. So you're also an Anglophile, <laughs> right? Um, no, but on a serious note, Dave, I mean, um, just, just given your own expertise, uh, to actually have the president of, the, of, of China, um, vice chancellor, writing uh, a two volume series called The Governing of China. 1,000 pages each, um, um, Dean. Um, it's, it's serious. It's thinkers. They, they think through. And of course, uh, like Arthur, the Chinese don't think in terms of, of years. They think in terms of centuries. The impact the book will have 100 years from now. But very important insight. Um, David, uh, Dr. Mpofu, welcome. I saw you walking in, uh, Jetro. Welcome. And by the way, I, I enjoyed uh, your debates on um, the, the diplomatic spat between Pretoria and Washington. I enjoyed your inputs. Uh, Jetro Mpofu from the um, Center for Diversity Studies at WITS. Welcome. Thank Good to sir. see you again. Thank you so much. Yeah, I will be speedy uh, in the interest of time. That is already, I think, um, advanced. Congratulations, Prof, for this compendium. Um, a book is a good book if it can survive jokes. I, I joked about the size um, and also just the massive content um, that is in this book. Because the reading audience is dying, we might need to translate this into a documentary, like audio and visual, so that most of the people that really need to read what is here access it. Because readers are becoming fewer and uh, fewer. And it frustrates me that the people who really need this might be intimidated by sheer size and 
not engage with um, the important and very relevant content that is here. Uh, my contribution would be, what, what book is this? And why should we really get concerned and occupied with it? It's a book that joins an extended family of books that ponder the, the Zimbabwean Liberatory Project. But what Professor Mtambara does here, he expands the pondering beyond Zimbabwe to Africa and the Global South. There are such books as uh, one by Sabel Lovukachen, Do the Zimbabweans Exist? And then Professor Miles Tendis, Making History in Mugabe, Zimbabwe, Politics, Intellectuals, and the Media. And curiously, um, Bishop Abel Mzore was Rise Up and Walk. You know, Prof, when we grew up, we were told never to think about or to read anything about Mzorewa because he was a sellout. But now with our epistemic disobedience, when you open the pages of that book, you realize what we lost and what kind of leadership Zimbabwe was denied. Yeah, figures like Mzorewa and Davening Stolle were sort of banished from the Zimbabwean curriculum, the academy and the media landscape. But we lost a lot, a lot of nuggets from there. Then there's uh, Professor David Moore's um, Mugabe's legacy, coups, conspiracies, and the uh, conceits of power. And my Robert Mugabe, the will to power in an African post-colony. I'm just mentioning a few books alongside which uh, researchers can read this important book with. And also, um, speaking from a research perspective, not everything that has got covers is a book. But this is a book. And um, how is it a book? It's based on the authority of the author. Like, um, this book is written from a, a trained mind and a well-read mind. Mutambara doesn't enjoy the love of knowledge. I think he enjoys the fear of ignorance. You can only read this much if you are afraid of not knowing. Because the man collapses literature from different directions and uh, the ability to weave that together is impressive. It's a trained mind, well read, quite questioning, critical, experienced in the practical sense, and above everything else, a humanist. Uh, when people learn so much and think so deeply, they tend to apply themselves quite arrogantly along the way. But there's this problem that there is a lot of confidence. But that confidence is accompanied by humility. And the, the appetite to be taught by others, which makes you a, a relevant and important thinker. And then methodologically, the book is multidisciplinary to the point of being undisciplinary. <laughs> when you think you are engaging with a, a historian, the political theorist jumps in. When you think you are engaging with political theory, a, a philosopher comes by. When you think you are engaging with a philosopher, a proper sociologist also comes through. So these disciplinary currents that cut across the book makes the book undisciplinary and therefore I think decolonial in that. We have the method of no method, <laughs> but the book achieves its purpose, which is to, to circulate certain important ideas. And uh, it's rendered in lucid, transparent prose that can be read equally by uh, a novice and also an expert. A retired professor can read and enjoy, and I think a matric graduate will also be able to, to engage with you. And further on methodology, the book is quite archaeological in the sense in which the author excavates past events, present events, and also eschatological in the sense that you project futures, scenarios, possibilities, yeah, and prospects uh, for Zimbabwe, Africa, and the Global South. And it's a book that is written by a tragic optimist. <laughs> a thinker who is clear about the disaster that is on the ground, 
the tragedies that are on the ground, but the author still holds on to some hope that this can be salvaged. And in that way, the author becomes an idealist in the sense that Ntambara believes that ideas work and that ideas exist. And that through ideas, we can change the situation for the better. And uh, one impressive thing from a reader's perspective is the, the intersection of the geography and the biography of the book, in that the life story of the author is intersected with um, this geography. And the author expertly, I think now as an engineer, as um, one of my colleagues said, manages to really piece this together and say something about the Zimbabwean, African, and the global South condition, and make suggestions as to what the youths can do to salvage the situation, to recover the global South from the, the tragedies that we are talking about. Uh, thematically, Prof, um, I'm about done. Um, I identified a few themes which I can highlight. Uh, Mutambara suggests what I can call, a, you know, a political Pentecost. <laughs> that people of different intellectual and political persuasions can find each other above party lines and do something about their situation. Um, the solution for Zimbabwe's problem, Mutambara picks it above the party divide, above the ethnic divides, above the class divides, above narrow interests. And that's where the idealism of Mtambara comes in as well. As it. It's so difficult, if you observe the Zimbabwean political condition, to get the political enemies to talk. Because political change, which leads to social change, only takes place meaningfully when enemies speak. That's when the political happens, as um, um, Chantal Moff says. When you change from enmity to adversaries that can engage together, change from antagonism to agonism. That's what Mtambara persuades the belligerents in Zimbabwe to do. But um, my experience and observation has shown that um, Zimbabwean political gatherings, congregations and groupings become fundamentalist in that even talking and greeting each other becomes taboo. And that prevents enemies and opponents from talking so that they can collapse into adversaries that can work together and change the situation. So that political Pentecost is what Mtambara is asking for. Our ability to cross borders, party lines, and engage. Mtambara also proposes decolonial pan-Africanism, where a united Africa becomes an Africa that is open to itself first, then to the world next. I think Mtambara preponders that point over and over again that we need a united Africa, an Africa that can be taken seriously. I think that's the point you were making when I was coming in. And that's an important point. Just to look at how African post-colonial leaders have gone on to respect and to fortify and to use colonial borders is tragic. What the colonizer did, the decolonizers are afraid of even touching. It's like these borders were put down by a god. Yet they are just maps that the colonizer put around in order to manage and discipline us. No one wants to think about the end of um, colonial borders. Uh, Mutambara has a fundamental disrespect for colonial borders in his observations, arguments, and conclusions. In this book and outside, I have had the, the privilege to engage with himself and his work in different fora. And what kind of Africa is Mutambara talking about? It's a troubled continent that is trying to navigate its miserable life in a troubling world. Like we are fast being collapsed into another sphere of influence again. A new scramble for Africa is afoot. Each and every country must stand up and wake up in the morning and try to dramatize where it stands vis-a-vis -vis the blocks that are at play. And it shouldn't be so if Africa was united. Just when that spat, um, arose, Prof. No single African country came to say, leave South Africa alone. Everyone looked down. And I could observe that the design, true or false, that some Nobukeris and Okapis were transported to Russia, <laughs> the effect of the communication was to scare every African country away 
from the BRICS alliance, from China, from Russia, and other uh, possibilities. And this is an Africa that is littered with coups. The terrorist scorch is expanding. Wars, look at Sudan. Disease. Corruption, mega corruption, where presidents, once again, are becoming richer than their countries. One of the most exciting moments in the Zaire in Congo parliament was when Mobutu Sesoseko stood up to donate money to the country or to borrow the country money. <laughs> in Zimbabwe, it's close to that, where the president, family, friends in France are richer than the national economy under our watch. And gender-based violence and femicide, homophobia and xenophobia and other phobias that are making life and existence in Africa um, toxic. What else do I want to say quickly, Prof? Um, the Zimbabwean problem is not a problem of uh, democratization. It's not a problem of the search for human rights. It's a problem of native colonialism, where the post-colonial leadership has become colonial in every sense except that the colonialism is perpetuated by natives. Power is held on to through force and fraud. Corruption smells high to heaven. It's, it's, it's not even the gold mafia. It's to insult the mafia to call that the gold mafia. <laughs> the mafia don't conduct themselves like that. Not the Costa Nostra, at least. And what Al Jazeera showed is a tip of the iceberg. They just traced one small network. The networks are many, but they all report in one center. One of the reason why, reasons why Mugabe had to be toppled was his talk about the 15 billion that was mixing from Chiazo. That was one of the triggers of the coup. Because Mugabe told the nation that we are missing 15, US, 15 billion US dollars. We don't know where it went. Uh, some people could not stomach that, and Mugabe had to, to go. Um, it's a struggle of liberation in Zimbabwe, a total struggle of liberation with everything that is needed to undo colonialism. What is Professor Mtambara in all this? Uh, Hannah Arendt gave us um, a description uh, in the human condition, vita activa, vita contemplativa, a life of contemplation, that is mixed with a life of activism. Vita activa, vita contemplativa. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've just elevated you. Uh, well deserved. Just want to say something about Dr. Mpofu. I mean, we've shared many platforms, and, and I say without a shred of assertion VC that together with Prof. Gacheni, uh, Prof. our own Prof. Zondi and others, they are the ones that really did groundbreaking work on coloniality, <laughs> not to be confused with colonialism um, or decolonization. So coloniality is after the colonizers have left, the vestiges are all there and we scramble after them. Man, what a description, political Pentecost. It's just, I really, really like that. You even have your own methodology, undisciplinarity, <laughs> right? When you describe some of his characteristics, Dr. Mpofu, we just have to have a conversation about that at some point. So was the man with his undisciplinary method, was he disciplined himself or was he ill-disciplined? man. And in, just in terms of the book, yeah, um, it's quite intimidating. He's an intimidating character as well. So last but by no means least, uh, Prof. Tapua. And then uh, Prof. Tia will close us out. So it's, it's guide, guided democracy. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, it's all right. It's all right, Prof. Go ahead. Good. Uh, great. Uh, a very good evening, uh, colleagues. 
uh, Vice Chancellor uh, Pedi uh, and Professor Atham Tambara, uh, all protocol uh, observed. Um, I would like to, to, to extend my hearty congratulations uh, to Professor Atham Tambara uh, for managing to come up uh, with uh, you know, a vo voluminous uh, third installment uh, in his uh, autobiography of thought uh, leadership, uh, a trilogy of uh, reflections that uh, span of uh, four decades. Uh, so kudos to you, Prof. Uh, uh, Prof Mutambara, I found your intimidating volume three in the series of thought leadership uh, quite enlightening uh, in, in unpacking uh, some of the drama, uh, intrigue, and, uh, and uh, operations of the government of national unity, the GNU uh, in Zimbabwe, which you were a part of uh, as the deputy prime minister between 2009 and uh, 2018. Uh, I also found uh, the book uh, quite uh, insightful uh, in its narration uh, of uh, some of the rulings ZANU PF parties, uh, you know, machinations and uh, modus operandi, as you alluded to earlier. Uh, since the days of the liberation struggle uh, from the 1960s uh, up until uh, the present day, and uh, what others have termed uh, the, the, the Second uh, Republic, uh, especially as seen through the lens uh, of, the, of the wily and uh, ruthless uh, political operator, uh, the former president, uh, Robert uh, Gabriel Mugabe, whom we had the opportunity to engage uh, at length uh, on different occasions uh, during the GNU. Uh, having read your book uh, in conjunction with others that have been written around Zimbabwe's uh, liberation struggle by the likes of uh, Masipula Sitole, uh, Joshua Ngomo, uh, Edgar Tekere, and Wilfred Zamanda, aka Zina Shemachingura, uh, it is very evident that uh, today's uh, ruling ZANU PF uh, party has never really morphed uh, from its culture of cutthroat uh, politics. Uh, greed for political power at almost um, any cost, uh, unbridled corruption, uh, damaging ethnic rivalry, and uh, you know, shameless psychophancy since its formation in 1963. Uh, such is the nature of the beast, uh, and uh, it is hardly surprising that uh, despite a, a tottering economy uh, over the last uh, two decades, uh, it, it has still managed to maintain its vice-like grip on uh, political power in Zimbabwe. So with such vices uh, being uh, entrenched among some of our political elites uh, over many decades, uh, one wonders whether the leading political opposition figures would uh, behave any differently if they were to assume the reins of power in Zimbabwe. Uh, the ordinary Zimbabwean people have suffered uh, for too long uh, and are in need of some you know, respite after years of being taken for granted by, by, by ruthless and greedy politicians, and would-be political leaders uh, would do well uh, to take a leaf uh, from some of your very sage advice uh, on how to exercise thoughtful leadership that would benefit uh, you know, the weary masses of, uh, of Zimbabwe. Um, and in line with your passion for the, for the academy, uh, you engage in critical and reaching uh, debates around pertinent issues that confront the whole of the African continent, uh, and not only uh, Zimbabwe, uh, around the importance of fostering you know, beneficial forms of uh, pan-Africanism, uh, and critically engaging the fourth industrial revolution, and some of its cutting edge technologies, especially artificial intelligence, AI, and the strides that are being made in this field, uh, and the, the, the inevitable ethical questions uh, which this technology raises uh, in contexts such as ours uh, that are replete with uh, inequalities along racial, class, gender, and geographical fault lines. Uh, so despite the great work done in volume three of the trilogy, Prof, uh, one is still left with some questions. Uh, and so, and uh, some of these which I would want to pose to you are, firstly, uh, would you say your close relationship with uh, former President Mugabe weakened your hand uh, in the GNU? Because when it was disbanded in 2013, uh, insufficient political and electoral reforms, uh, as you acknowledged earlier, uh, had been uh, uh, effected. Uh, 
even though you say that uh, the respect between the two of you was, uh, was, was mutual, one gets the sense that you appear to have been uh, you know, totally uh, awestruck uh, by your interactions <laughs> uh, with this uh, Machiavellian politician. Uh, and so might this have weakened your resolve to insist on some of the above mentioned uh, reforms? Uh, was a political opportunity missed here, uh, Prof? Uh, secondly, uh, in the event that you are invited to save the people of Zimbabwe by either ZANU-PF or the Triple C after this year's elections as a government official, would you take up such an offer? And then lastly, would you consider rejoining you know, the, the rough and tumble uh, of Zimbabwean politics uh, in the near future uh, through forming your own political party or even joining any of those that are already in existence? Uh, otherwise, thank you so much, Prof. Mutambara, and again, many kudos for documenting your experiences uh, in Zimbabwe's treacherous uh, political terrain in recent times. Uh, thank you so much, colleagues. Prof, yes. you are protected by the chair. He has to answer. He will, he will, he will respond. He will respond. Thank you. <laughs> so, so we see, I know we're running over time. Um, in fact, there was a similar question. Just, just give me a few questions uh, online. So what I want to do, quite a, I'm sorry that I'm not standing up here because I have a computer in front of me. Yeah, so I have two questions online as well, and then I'm just going to allow, and let there be three questions from the audience, get Prof. Mutambara to um, respond. Get, get Prof. Professor Mutambara to respond. If you do have plans to um, form another party, please, you can't use the name the UJ party. That name is, <laughs> that name is, already, that name is already taken. Um, so let me just read the two questions. The one is... Prof. Lansburg talked about Zimbabweanization of South Africa. Can you kindly explain? Uh, meet me online and I'll explain what I mean. I don't want to gate crash his party. Prof. Mutambara, and that's exactly what Prof. Tapiwa just asked. You were invited by Prof. Mube to join his MDC. Prof. Mube has now joined Chamisa. And also, did you get rid of Mube? Just answer that as well. Are we likely to see you joining Triple C anytime soon? Prof, do you plan to leave UJ soon? That, that's the question. That, that's the question. Okay? The VC is here, we would like to know. So that we can plan for succession. Right, that was the question. I'm going to take two to my left, where Prof Artemut Ambara belong, and two to his right, where his future party belongs. So let's start on the left, too. Right, we're gonna be crisp to the point. Malusi Nube. That, by the way, is not the Nube that was referred to. That was uh, well from one, two, testing, one, two. Yeah. One, two, testing. Go ahead, go ahead. Can you hear me? Oh. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. First and foremost, my greetings and gratitude goes to my VC, Prof Mpedi, Prof Kamila Naidu, the Dean, Prof. Landsberg and Prof. Susie, my incredible PhD supervisors. And to you, congratulations, Prof. Mtambara, and to the house. Uh, Prof. Mtambara, thank you very much for the work that you've done. It's very critical. It will encourage upcoming generations, those who will pick it up. Fate is fate is there. And when I listened to you, you carried the ordinary person because you rightly said when you were seeing your pictures here, you spoke about you yourself having kwashioka. So your past hasn't left you, and you're doing this for the people. That's the feeling I get, because there is unemployment, endemic poverty, and all that. And you are trying to encourage the voiceless. And thank you for that. Now, my question to you, on one part, you spoke about fiscal consolidation that has to be done in Zimbabwe. You're talking about the problems within. And a lot of your problems I heard you spoke about within, but you did in your prophecy introduce that there's also problems without. I haven't seen a loud articulation of those outside problems that 
negatively impact, and I think there has to be balance in that. And how do we engage with that, the outside problems that are impacting the physical point of Africa, the physical point of Zimbabwe, because you cannot have a hyper uh, hyperinflation that is in Zimbabwe, because even the one in Chile, even the one after first world war, second world war was not like this, it was attended to. So please, can you comment on that? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh Malusi, and thank you for uh, thanking Prof. Susie and I, but we, we cannot influence the examiners. We can't guarantee uh, what the outcome will be, but thank, thanks for acknowledging your, your supervisors. Uh, another one to the left. Going, going to the right. Thank you. Just introduce yourself briefly. Thank you very much, and then... Thank you very much. My name is Mashiri Rarima. Uh, first of all, congratulations, Prof, for your uh, third book. Uh, it's really um, exciting to follow your journey and to get inspired. My question really is uh, uh, regarding your, um, your focus and passion about African integration, and, um, and right, rightfully so. But uh, recently we've, we've started to see, for example, uh, the likes of the president of uh, Kenya, William Ruto, uh, speaking the language that you kind of speaking, that as Africa, we need to come together and negotiate together. We're not going to be invited as individuals, but as the AU. What are your thoughts on that? Is there any uh, hope and uh, real prospects there, or it's maybe going to be another uh, Magufuli miscarriage? Thank you. Thank you very much. Gentlemen uh, in front of you. Right, right in front of you. Thank you. Good things uh, to the sitting and the pro protocol observed. Uh, we see that Prof uh, is truly a jack of all trades, a transdisciplinary approach. So with regards to that, uh, he spoke about uh, some abundant uh, approach that exists within the political thinking and the other multidisciplinary thinking. So what is the next approach to, to demystifying into how African continental free trade could adopt the notion of having their internal constitution drafted by their own patriots and compatriots to be able to reach that pinnacle of having a national uh, dream or approach. And then what are the mechanisms that will be put in place to remove those katomas to drive that notion so that it can be an engineering application. Thank you. Thank you very much. Prof. Uh, five questions, one minute per question. You're no, long, you're no longer my boss, so take that as like, uh, Prof, over to you. And then we'll close up with Prof. Uh, Tia. Okay. Is that secret? Thank you very much. I'll try to be very brief. Listen, if you read the book, <laughs> I was not, I was struck by Mugabe. That's why he liked me. I was not scared of him. In the first sessions, uh, and I'll give you a bit of what's in the book, Mugabe was a very poor chair of cabinet. When you were speaking, he would say, hey, what is you, what is you? And the Zanu guys would say, Your Excellency, I take it back, I, 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 I recant. They would break down and, and back off. He tried it with me. <laughs> I was ready for him. I said, Mr. President, I'm completely in disagreement with you. I do not share your view on this matter. Then I shut up. <laughs> he was shocked. No one has, has ever spoken to him like that. So, so what do you mean? Then I went and I hit him. Going forward, he never, ever interfered feared with my discourse because he knew that I would fire back. So listen, uh, he, he respected my guts and my ability to tell him off when necessary. Whereas other people would back off and he didn't respect them. I'll give you an, an example of a trip I had. It's in the book, I think. We went from Zimbabwe to Angola. Mugabe was in the middle. I was here. And Munangago was on the other side. In four hours, there was no conversation between Mnangagwa and Mugabe. There was nothing there. Mugabe had no respect for him. But with yours truly, <laughs> we are debating and discussing. So no, 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 read the book. 
I was not awestruck. I mean, I, I, no, he was awestruck, I think. <laughs> Listen, I'm not waiting to be invited. I'll be part of the change. I'll work hard with everyone in Zimbabwe to bring about change. So I'm part of the Zimbabwean society. I'm part of the African family. And I'll try my best to be part of the struggles. Uh, Professor Ngube, well, worked very well, but we had a little fight. Read the book. <laughs> you hear uh, my side of the argument. He read his own book, but I've written mine. And I've explained what happened, but we were colleagues. We're still colleagues but I was also very truthful about some disagreements. Read the book. Uh, I'm in academia now, and I'm writing books. When the time comes for me to join, I'll do so, but now I'm in academia. I'm working with the vice chancellor here, generating knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> External problems. Listen, listen. We are sick and tired of colonialism, sanctions, the West. The world is not a... Nice place. There are so many bad things out there. But there are things we control. For example, I say, why don't you remove the sanctions you are imposing upon yourself before you ask others to remove sanctions on you? You are killing your own people. You are corrupt. You are incompetent. Those are sanctions. So yes, I know the external forces. There is neocolonialism. There is global dominance. They, but look at Kagami. What is Kagami doing? He's taking care of things that he controls, and Rwanda is moving. So I agree, we must handle the external factors, we must address the external factors, but sometimes there are things we do control, and let us do something about those things that we, we control. We must have urgency, okay? It's 60 years after political independence. Do we control our economies? Have we tried? So urgency, African urgency. Ruto is listening to me. Okay. Yes, I'm very happy. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying is, why would you go to have these African leaders with one president? African leaders with one president, why don't we work together and present one front? It's very easy for you to be bamboozled if you are little South Africa versus China, little South Africa versus America. But if you go as the continent with a common position, it is much easier for us to get a better deal. Malawi can't negotiate with Russia, negotiate with China or America, but the 1.3 billion Africans with a collective GDP of $2.5 trillion can extract a, a better deal. They can extract better concessions if they work together. So that approach is a good approach where they go to meet America represented at the AU level with a common position. Go to China with a common position. By the way, the Chinese and the Americans are not different on this matter. The Chinese want, to come, want you to come one by one. China and South Africa. China and Botswana. No, we must have the African continent negotiating with China. When we negotiate as a bloc, we get better deals for the continent. So that approach from Ruto is a very... But however, there's no such thing as a free lunch. These African leaders uh, want to have it both ways. When we are united in the United States of Africa, there will be one president, maybe coming from Togo. Ramaphosa will be Minister of Agriculture. Is he ready? <laughs> Mnangagwa will be Minister of the Youth. Is he prepared? <laughs> Ruto will be Minister of Agriculture in the United States of Africa. Wh why is that not possible? The United States has got one president. They're doing just fine. China, one president, they're doing just fine. India, one prime minister, they're doing just fine. There is no such thing as a free lunch. To achieve integration, you must give up on some elements of national sovereignty. To embrace continental sovereignty. You must be able to say, I'm an African first. A citizen of Sadak, second. South African, third. I know you don't want to say that. Because you are very national interest driven. But if you are going to achieve unity and continental integration, you must give up on some aspects. Don't you think California would have wanted to be a country? If California was a country to be number five economy, Georgia may be number eight. But Georgia in America, California in America, they gave up on those aspirations to build the United States of America, which is number one in the world. The biggest war 
the worst war that Americans ever fought was to keep America together in the Civil War. The people who died in the Civil War outnumber all the people that died in the First World War and Second War in terms of Americans. So they understand integration. It is not cheap. It comes with a price. So there's no such thing as a free lunch. Uh, so Ruto and his fellow presidents must realize that they are committed and there is going to be a, a, a price to pay. To show these guys are not serious, these African leaders, where have you ever seen a Minister of Finance say, I'm here in Parliament presenting a budget. As agreed at the AU, we're going to do the following. As agreed at SADC, we're going to do the following. We are going to spend $4 billion in Malawi because it is good for SADC. We are going to spend $2 billion in Rwanda because that's part of our Africa agenda. They don't. They present national budgets. Just watch it. Not a single one of them in South Africa, in Zimbabwe, in Rwanda, in Kenya. None of the ministers of finance ever refer to SADC, East African Community, ECOWAS, IGAD, or the African Union. So they're paying lip service. They talk it. They don't act it. So welcome, Ruto. But I want to see more work, uh, Mr. Ruto. Um, so there are sacrifices and... Uh, there are issues. So uh, in, in, in concluding in my remarks, uh, I'm trying my best to document and I'm trying to make a difference in my own small way. Let us make the problems of Africa our personal problems. Take a vested interest approach to these problems. Why? Because you could be a superstar vice chancellor. You could be a superstar professor. You could be a rock star. CEO, you could be an outstanding political player in your country, but you'll never be respected as an African until Africa has done well as a continent, until Africa has done well in terms of all the countries. They always ask you, if you are that smart, how come your country is messed up? I used to go to the World Economic Forum. You saw me with Bill Clinton there at the World Economic Forum. Yeah, you saw me. I used to you know, take the podium and speak. As you see, I love speaking. They'll say, ah, you speak very well. Where are you from? Then I choose not to answer. <laughs> I, I talk about where I've been. I've been to MIT, NASA, and McKinsey. I'm a rock star. I say, no, 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 no. Where are you from? Again, I try to not answer. I've written books and things. No, 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 no. What country? <laughs> then eventually I say, I'm from Zimbabwe. Oh, come on. <laughs> You're from Zimbabwe. If you are that smart, how come your country is messed up? You are no rock star Mtambara. You are just a failure. So my rock star status is undermined by the bankrupts of my country, the bankrupts of my continent. So I must take it personally. Otherwise, I'll never be respected with all those books. I thank you so very much. Thank you. Um, Prof. Theodore Vett, you've been very patient. Um, please close us out on a rock star note. <laughs> well, <laughs> can't do that. Prof. Pedi, colleagues, uh, friends, students, thank you for attending tonight. It was wonderful. And also to the people online, thank you for attending. And I want to acknowledge His Excellency Dr. Gomez the former Secretary General of the African, Caribbean, and Pacific Group of States, the ACP. Thank you for being patiently sitting through all of our um, endeavors here. Um, Prof. Mutambara, congratulations. It's also a beautiful moment for IFK, a very small little institute that is actually starting to punch above their weight. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to reading your book. Colleagues, I would like to express my sincere thanks and appreciation for the following. All of the colleagues for their comments. All of the readers of the book, the academic scholars, students, members of business and government who commented on the book. The publishing team, 
SAPIS, for their interest in the academic endeavor and their hard work in bringing the book to life. The cover designer and illustrators, the marvelous cover and fantastic images make reading a pleasure. Everyone mentioned that. They are a talented and creative group which adds visual appeal to the work. To the event organizers, the IFK team, sitting around here, led by Ms. Tandeka Novelle. Thank you very much. People don't realize what a big job this is. <laughs> Who has been phenomenal in making sure that everything was on point. And then lastly, colleagues, we are inviting you to enjoy some refreshments next door. And then I have a final message. Buy the book. <laughs> it's 400 rand for the soft cover and 500 rand for the hard cover. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And thanks, Chris, to you too for leading us through this whole event. Thanks Thank you very much, much Prof. In fact, Prof, thanks for those last words. I was actually going to say well done to the MC, but thank you very much for. Um, let, let, me, let me just conclude on this. Um, so, so Vice Chancellor, I was actually very serious when I said, um, in terms of that phenomenal achievement by the university, and I keep um, um, reminding um, people from, uh, from outside the university, um, uh, Prof. Perry and I are actually first generation Rao students. Uh, we were actually uh, studied together before uh, the merger. Uh, but for you to achieve that um, feed, Prof, without a medical school yet, I mean, that for me is the out, out, um, astounding thing. And it's actually um, scholars um, and scholar practitioners like Professor Mutambara um, that helps us to um, to soar um, above the clouds. Um, I just want to leave you with two thoughts, with, with, with three thoughts, by way of question, Mutamba, uh, Professor Mutambara. First of all, um, and here I think Dr. Mpofu will agree, what, the, what that, that seminal pivotal moment of 2015, 2016 with the decolonization movement and the fees must fall, movement did was to put on the agenda um, the decolonization of epistemology. And what Professor Mutambara has demonstrated and, and really eloquently um, described by Dr. Mpofu is that even methodologically, the sky is the limit. Let's, let's test these old um, methodologies, theories. Um, let's come up with new uh, approaches to studies and stuff. And that's what Prof did. In fact, before you walked in, uh, Dr. Mpofu, um, I made the very point that, that, that you made. I've, I've known this man for um, 32 years, 33 years plus. We were students together and student leaders together. Uh, and by the way, he's got a very long-standing relationship. He had a long-standing relationship with uh, President Mugabe. Uh, even a student leader, the Zimbabweans will tell you, he went head to head with a much more vibrant President Mugabe at the time, even Prime Minister at the time. But, but, but Professor Mutambara has been practicing multidisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity, undisciplinarity for the first time, right? Um, just, just an eclectic would be to do injustice to Prof's work. It's not eclectic. It's bringing different schools of thought, paradigms, uh, theories and stuff together. And I think that is the first thing I would like to uh, commend you um, on. Let me touch on a second point, Prof, and link it to a point you've <coughs> made. And you've actually said it, I just want to amplify it. Yes, we are 1.3 billion. So we, we are able to compete with China and with India. Our problem is exactly what you've said. Dr. Mpofu, I also put this challenge to you and all those of you who study Pan-Africanism. VC, our problem is exactly what Professor Mutambara said. We are 55. And how do we get 55 to speak as one? 
And one thing I want to throw out there for Prof. Mutambara and, and everybody else, what about this debate that's starting about transcending Pan-Africanism as we knew it and starting to engage with global Africanism? Let's stop seeing people of African descent as diaspora, but let's see African, Africa as a global actor by including people of African descent, not as part of a diaspora, but the concept of global Africanism. I want to so, And then the final point, Prof, um, I, I want to make is that to see, to see the lack of agency, and VC just think about this. Here we have five African states preparing to go on a mission to go and make peace in Ukraine and Russia. And it's fascinating that nobody has shot it down yet, not even the G7. But the G7 laid on some interesting terms. But while we're going to fly over the continent, there's a war happening in Sudan that started on a Saturday morning. And the Americans and the Saudi Arabians are doing the mediation. And I can tell you what's going to happen there. It's predictable, Prof. There's going to be one African state that's going to end up taking America's side in the proxy wars that's coming. We are about to become the theater where this global rivalry is going to play itself out. Um, this time, economically and even militarily. So that makes a mockery of African agency. There are, you can show me the electoral map of Africa right now. Who's going to elections where? I mean, we can predict the fallout that are going to come. Three priorities that I would do as Africans right now. Libya, destroyed by NATO, needs this continent's attention badly at the moment. I've mentioned Sudan. And there is a conflagration that's going to play itself out in the DRC. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure it out. But we're going to go and make peace in Ukraine and Russia, in part VC, because our beloved country now has to restore its global credibility. That's why we came up with this initiative. African agency and African solutions for African problems must stop being just meaningful, meaningless words. Thank you, friend, colleague, mentor. Continue to do the good work that you do. And I just end by reminding all of you about one thing. He is so much in awe of President Mugabe. <laughs> Both of them never indulge in a single drop of alcohol. Thank you very much. It was <laughs> lovely to have all of you. Um, uh, wonderful. Thanks, IKS team. It's, it's been wonderful. Uh, please join us uh, to engage in soft drinks, Prof Mutambara. And for those of you who want something harder, we hope you have a credit card. Thank you very much. The University of Johannesburg, the future reimagined.